Okay, let's get started. This is Turtle Time, one of the longest Bravo podcasts in history, and just as long as Nick Vial's podcast with Tom Sandoval and Tom Schwartz. Yeah, we'll see if we can beat it lengthwise. I, why, well, how long was it? Two hours and 55 minutes? <laughs> was it that long? I thought it was like, oh, I thought it was almost three hours. I thought he was trying to compete with Turtle Time a little bit. I know, he Maybe, was coming for us. If it, if it was two hours and... Or, and 30 or over I, we can't compete with him today but uh, yeah people have to be We've rest got places ass- to be but people have been rest <laughs> should be rest assured that we've beaten him a hundred times in length you know in past oh, yeah. episodes yeah what's our longest oh yeah he it was he was two and a half hours oh okay okay so yeah that's respectable length i mean he's he pushed to the boundaries of turtle time yeah he's learning uh from us that long form is where it's at do you think that, uh, not to get straight into it, but there was sort of like 45 minutes at the <laughs> beginning where it, I don't know necessarily if that needed to be included. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't usually listen to that podcast, so I didn't really know the format. So at first I started putting on, I was cleaning my house and then they talked about Taylor Swift for like four hours and then... They talked about like The Bachelor for a while and I was like, when is this going to be over? Then Schwartz came and that was on for a long time before because now I think famously Sandoval was extremely late. He forgot to come. I think so. (laughs) I think so. I think I'm still skeptical of of the whole process there. You think it was a a scheme? It seemed a little um, cute and a little, um, I don't know, the phone call struck me as sort of uh, performative. Interesting. And, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what the hell was going on, but in my opinion, we didn't need to know any of that stuff. Right. I, it just, it would be, my opinion is that if you and I had a guest on, let's say Tom Sandoval, and he was 45 <laughs> minutes late for our recording, I don't think you and I would like record for 45 minutes talking about how late he is and then keep everything You would in. toss that Schwartz portion? In the well, trash can? he didn't have to start with Schwartz. He just yeah. started. But in their defense, they did not, to what they were saying, they didn't know if he was going to come. So it's then they would have like lost their time there. I, I, yeah, I guess so. I just didn't, I think that there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that we don't <laughs> see on a lot of different podcasts in terms of guests being late or not thinking they're booked or whatever. And I feel like they made an unnecessary meal of that whole thing to hype up the episode by making it overly dramatic. Yeah. And I didn't need to know that Tom Sandoval was late. You, they could have not had the 30 minutes with Schwartz or said, we're not, sorry, I'm, we're going to wait until Sandoval gets here. Yeah. And then not made a huge big deal of it but i am in the minority on that i already have people that are so mad that i am excusing tom sandoval for being late and someone just i just read a comment that said you were showing that you have no respect for people's time and a guest could come on turtle time and do that to you all and you would be fine with it so i don't think so their ass would be out the door i know i just i yeah so anyway well we got right into it um well i don't know is there anything else to say before we get into the 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 news about it. I just I I felt a little demoralized about my take on this Nick okay. Bial interview. I didn't know Sandoval. all that had happened. I was a little off the grid. I'm but... in the I'm in the trenches. You fighting, are. Thank you. Fighting my uh, <laughs> tick people on TikTok who say this was one of the best interviews they've ever heard in their life, and that I'm defending Tom Sandoval for criticizing Nick Bial's interview style style and mm-hmm. tactics, and uh, it's the. I've never been on this much of the wrong side of of history in a long time. I I can't even think of one take I've had. Even with the Erica Jane take last week, I thought I would be dead in the water. And I got more positive feedback on that than I did for this. Hashtag Regal gift card. Yeah. Yeah. You got one person that said you were the certified stinker. I know. But I liked that. Me too. It was fun. I I just like that there's, you know, that that was about as bad of a take as someone can have. And there was still some, there was a lifeline there for me. But I feel a Sandoval really elicits a huge emotional response in people. It's kind of interesting. And that's why I want to, that's what I, that was my takeaway from this. Is, yeah. Is that um, at what point does your <laughs> hatred for someone consume all 
of your rationale and opinions so that you can't even tolerate one second that would that maybe put them in a in a different light sure or or i will say um as you know i was the first i was very early to say it was all a little much on the hatred or whatever that said he did not do himself any favors in this interview uh as someone who is willing to go along with certain logic to be like i'll hear you out i won't do a hundred percent team ariana a hundred percent of the time just because usually she is the more um logical thinker uh Mm -hmm. and deserving of you know whatever she needs to do because of what happened um so you know obviously it tends to lean on her side but he's um not good at uh talking uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay. He's okay. not articulate. All right. He's not articulate. <laughs> he said um, fuck 4,000 times. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't notice that. I think I was desensitized to <laughs> the F word coming from his mouth. Um, I have a question. And this is, I'm, I, I am advocating for the devil. Okay. Oh, well. The devil, I know, Ariana said this, and she's right that the devil already has a lot of advocates. Is that what she said? Yeah. The devil, okay. But what, at this point, at (laughs) this point, I swear, I I swear, I've heard every single version of an apology of what Tom Sandoval can say regarding Scandoval. And I'm not defending him. I'm... I have outspoken about how horrible he completely shattered my perception of him as a person. I think he's horrible, a cheater, a liar. He fully rebounded uh, in my eyes after season three of Vanderpump Rules, and I considered him my favorite cast member. And I was shattered by what he did. I think it's in a non-parasocial way. I don't know him. But I'm just saying, like, as a viewer, yeah. I, he was let down by him. I, I realized I didn't know him. So I couldn't have been more against what he did. And it, it, it's horrible. But at this point, I swear, I have heard... His apology about this <laughs> mm-hmm. in every single facet of how upset he is and what he did wrong. I've listened to his podcast probably more than the average <laughs> audience. Yeah. So maybe I'm I'm more knowledgeable about what he's been said. But there is nothing that he could have said in that environment that would have redeemed him. Yeah. This is not the forum for him to be redeemed. And Nick Vial is the, a horrible, horrible uh, interviewer, <laughs> in, in my opinion. You thought he was too staunch, like he was, too he, against. He he just he well. First of all, he doesn't know what it, what the fuck he's talking about. Yeah, besides he hasn't what he's, seen the show. He hasn't seen the show. So first off, he's he has a huge um, disadvantage to yeah. uh, properly conducting an interview. Uh, I also think his demeanor in terms of treating Tom like a piece of shit is complete posturing for his audience. Yeah, because he's more on he like employs Katie and Dana and stuff. And so he like wants to be anti Tom because he thinks he's serving his base. But I don't think he actually harbors those feelings because he doesn't know him at all. He doesn't yeah. even really know what he did. He never had this moral conundrum following Tom Sandoval's journey. He barely knows him. Yeah. So I just think all of that is posturing and fake. And I think he, I also didn't like that Nick Vial was like acting as if he was the moral arbiter of what a good human is in this instance. And in, in, in talking about like the advice he would give to Tom Sandoval to try to try to like save his soul the entire <laughs> time. That's not really the, the, what an interviewer should do. Yeah. It kind of felt like he was trying to drive him mad. Yeah, a little bit. I, I, yeah, I guess. Maybe it worked. People are like, oh, it's good that he treated him like shit. Interviewers should treat their guests like shit if they hate them. And I'm like, I guess. Yeah. I'm like, I think that if um, I know that they were doing each other favors, doing each other's podcasts, so maybe Sandoval felt obligated because he had Nick Vile on his. No, uh, Tom, Tom is doing Nick a favor. Tom is doing Nick a favor. Tom just said, be reciprocal and go on mine before I go on yours. Okay. Nick wanted Tom on his podcast, obviously. Okay. He wants this. Well, I think that, well, I don't think that if Tom doesn't have anything new to say, any new revelations, any, I don't know, uh, any light to shed, he shouldn't do shows like this because all he can do is dig himself into a deeper hole. He isn't articulate he's not um he always takes sort of like he ends up justifying what he did in some way even though you know 
I'm sure there were facets of it where, you know, he said that Ariana was abusive to him, that, you know, they had a terrible relationship, that like their, uh, his support wasn't reciprocated Mm -hmm. and like all of this stuff. They didn't have sex for a year, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I get that probably elements of that are true for sure. They had a bad relationship that should have ended. Like, I believe that. But it's like, if you're not going to, first of all, is that the environment in which you want to share that information? Second of all, like, can you package it in a way that is easy for people to understand? Are you... It was easy for me to understand. Not to interrupt you. Go ahead. I just, he, he's like a chaotic figure who he couldn't finish a sentence it was like maybe that was partially like the interview style and it just kind of kept going round and round he would like repeat himself he was kind of like victimizing himself which I know that he was like put through hell for sure um but it feels like he needs to like step away he's been non-stop talking this whole fucking time Mm -hmm. like it's like just like step away and come back when you have wisdom wisdom he like pretends that he has like learned and he's like, I've been almost kind of sober for eight months. And it's like, OK, so you like half ass kind of stop drinking a little bit and like. But do we I mean, do we went on world's toughest test right. and like I just I don't know why we need to hear from him. Well, because Nick or asked, Rachel. Well, Nick asked him. No, I know, but why does he want to talk? Like what's because he, he's a performative <laughs> man who agreed to do this podcast and sit down there and be asked questions and he I, I i know like i know what people think he should do which is cry and say i'm so sorry i don't want to hear him cry well okay then he can't <laughs> cry because people will say he has crocodiles here so don't cry <laughs> maybe have a little whimper in your voice as you start to speak that borders on crying and say i am so sorry there is no excuse for what i did absolutely nothing justifies my behavior i will never do it again uh and i i can't believe the hell i put through ariana uh put her through and she can do whatever she wants to me because all of it is justified it's like those four sentences and then say nothing else well that's not fun to listen to either which is why i'm like just don't do it because you can't win but so be smart okay yeah this goes uh, sort of this goes to my uh what's it called Uh, this goes to my belief that i would rather a real chaotic unhinged answer that reflects how you really feel (laughs) than a pr packaged uh sanction i mean i was surely entertained whether that's good for uh his brand or did, not did it, i don't know did it okay so this is i'm I, I like talking about it with you because you don't feel it all the same way as me and i it's good to have your take on this was your opinion on tom sandoval i'm sure he's he was he's in the you know the dog with house with you uh, you know with both of us as a as a cast member he's a four out of ten on the favorability uh, uh-huh. r- ranking right did this at all make him less favorable to you or more, not, I assume not more favorable to you. Not more. I feel like I actually give him more benefit of the doubt without him talking. <laughs> like I can just like apply empathy towards him. And then when he starts talking, I have less. <laughs> like, I... like, think about it. Ariana, you know, she's been doing, she has been talking about the scenario a lot in the sense that she's participated in the brand deals um, the, um, you know, cocktail book, like her career is currently based around the affair. So in that sense, it's not like she's not talking about it, but we really kind of only got that one, like call her daddy. And then like, she's been on like, watch what happens or whatever, but she like, kind of like, doesn't really talk about it, Mm -hmm. which I think is like, comes off so much better. Yeah. I think she is tired of even being asked questions related to Scandaval. Like yeah. she's on the other end of it where she doesn't even want to bring this up if interviewers weren't asking her about it constantly. Yeah. I mean, it is kind of like, but um, Nick, Nick did, Nick did want him on the podcast and asked him questions. Of course he did. To, Cause it's probably going to be like the like highest listened episode. So, but I'm saying, yeah, because it got us on board. So they, <laughs> yeah, I never listened list- to that podcast and I will not again. <laughs> no, me neither. Yeah. I never would again either. Um, ever in my life. Um, but what was I going to say? It, it, I, I mean, we fault him for agreeing to go on Nick's podcast and answering the questions in his mind 
truthfully or in what his truth is? No, I mean, he can do whatever he wants. I just think that he came off poorly. Yeah, he, he came off poorly. <laughs> I I agree that... Um, he's just kind of like... I don't think my basic takeaway was that I don't think he's maniacal. I don't think he's a sociopath. He's maybe like narcissistic, but is he a narcissist? I th- no, I don't. I mean, I don't know, but like, I think he's kind of just dumb and yeah. like immature. Yeah. I think that's it. I think he just like, he fucked up because he did what he wanted to do. He was like too weak to deny what felt good. Mm-hmm. He wanted to party and be a Peter Pan and he it blew up in a way he could have never imagined and he's not equipped to handle in any way yeah most people wouldn't be but uh i don't think he's even capable of like understanding what this whole thing is it's like too crazy yeah i yeah i i i guess so i think um i'm probably a little dulled to the impact of of scandal now just because it has been uh, you know, yeah. 10 months. And so like hearing Nick Vial ask these same questions over and over again, the same five questions, like, do you yeah. regret it? Right. Uh, do you feel bad? Are you really sorry? Why do you say a, but after that word, I was just like, <laughs> I have heard these yeah. questions asked of Tom Sandoval 50 times. Yeah. And at this late, at this late uh, stage of Scandoval, it, it just, I, um, besides the new anecdotes that Tom Sandoval offered, which made him, it did make him look bad. It did make him look bad. But I guess, um, <laughs> I guess ultimately, uh, I don't know what the takeaway is from this interview other than uh, I shouldn't have probably listened to it, maybe, <laughs> because it made me mad uh, overall. And uh, I didn't learn anything new besides that Tom Sandoval like offered to buy Ariana's I know. I loved the money details. I could have, that should have just been about that. Yeah. So um, he offered her $3.1 million, which is over a million dollars over the asking price or the original to stay in price, his house. Um, which I'm very curious if someone will run the numbers on if that is like a really great offer or not. I assume it is. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, yeah. I think it's for Ariana, it's just the, uh, principle right sure you know and i'm sure it's i'm sure it's i don't know i'm sure people will go oh actually no it's not even close to what you know i mean i agree with him that she's being petty like i think maybe she would say that herself but whether or not you think it's a good idea as tom sandoval to go on public podcast and call her petty uh maybe not the best. So does it just reinforce <laughs> that Tom Sandoval is a shitty person? And I think he's like, it's a truly impossible position because there's nothing he can say to dig him out himself out. There's what no- if he did what I, my strategy of crying, saying nothing I can ever do will ever, you know, fix the, the wound I created. I have no excuses. There's no but here. And I want Ariana to do whatever the hell she wants to me to get over this. You know, and I'll do anything yeah. to support her. What if he just said those six things over and over again would, and <laughs> and bordered on crying? Would people be like, whoa, that's contrition? Probably not. Right. I don't. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I, don't, I think <laughs> I've heard that exact thing. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. So I think it's weird because I feel like we've all slightly moved on as a community. And then now this new season, the weirdest thing about it is having to put yourself back into like May, June or right. whatever and have to like remember what it was like at that time because you're kind of like, uh, like, we get it. Like, yeah. we've like, we've been through it already in real time because we experienced the entire thing in real time. So it's like, it feels like going back and then listening to rachel's podcast she's doing the same thing where she's still recounting every moment how it started what happened how the producers made her do xyz in last season or whatever and i'm like why are we still talking about i'm like we literally talk about this for a living and i'm over it (laughs) well um (laughs) yes i think i think you know, with time, people, it's it starts to lose a lot of its luster, and it already has. And I think that they all, everyone needs to find a path forward to talk about new things and make 
Vanderpump Rules season 11 about something new. We don't know, you know, it's already been filmed, but like what they can do post Scandaval. Um, and I think you're right. We're running on fumes here with the new details that can be added about this thing that happened 10 months ago. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't really know. I think that, um, I, I guess I'm still, I don't know with Rachel goes rogue. I'm still, to me, it's still enlightening to like hear, I don't know. Did you listen to chapter five, the newest chapter? I listened to, I think half of it where she, what was it? She was like answering questions, like clarifying. Well, she always answers questions from an unseen, you know, producer. Right. It's in the corner, but she does. She does say, I don't know if like, I, it's almost like she the things that she goes rogue on. I almost don't want to know because it shows the producer impact so yeah. much. But what she was specifically talking about in chapter five, chapter five, is that um, she said that like when she had to leave Tahoe, do you listen yeah. to that part? Yeah. That they were like producers specifically said, well, if you're gonna leave, you have to say these two things to Lala, and they were giving her notes of yeah. what would be a good point to say back to Lala. And I was just thinking like. Wow, I mean that's sort of interesting. For first off, I would yeah. never imagine that producers just do that, pull right. you in do a you corner. Do you think they like only do that to her? Yeah, was, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> I honestly think that Rachel might have a isolated experience or a unique experience here because she might be the only one that sort of needed this help right. to navigate scenes. And because, we could tell because yeah, right. Because I really don't think Lala is like well, actually, well, maybe she is receiving some notes, but <laughs> yeah. someone like Ariana or or Tom who are more well versed in the this universe don't need guidance. So right. I don't know if she is actually speaking for the overall production or not, or if right. just specifically she needed help in some of these scenes. Yeah. That was hilarious. And she was like, uh, one of the things they told her was like, you need to uh, stand up for yourself and tell Lala, like who's she to tell you that, uh, that she wouldn't trust her man around you when she is the one who has like cheated or whatever. And Rachel was like, that's a good point. And yeah. I'm like, you didn't even make that connection. Right. So it's like, like it literally happened to you. Yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. And, and you can imagine other cast members being ready with that very of easily course. without any help. Um, um, well, before we, before we transition, I don't know if we want to talk about Rachel goes rogue too much, but I just want to ask, I mean, cause I don't want my take on the Nick Vial thing to like override <laughs> the overall turtle time, uh, you know, analysis, but how, how did you like having listened to two hours and 30 minutes of it? How did you feel ultimately after it? Like closing, thoughts um well throughout i was you know sort of just like smh like lol smh like <laughs> at, at, at the at the really dumb things he was adding to the conversation yeah he's just sandoval's like, a liar cake oh my god that was hilarious right that was like his last straw like i don't i really don't understand why i mean did he really love that bakery like he must have i think you i think sandoval's a liar cake represented the corporate response right. to scandoval yeah like you know when like wendy's will like tweet like um you know i don't i don't know if it's a really hot day out they'll say well no no sorry that's not a good example but whatever they, they get in on like a pop culture sure. thing like can you believe Christopher Walken on SNL? He should have walked into Wendy's and gotten a Frosty. Or you know yeah. what I mean? It's like I I think he was more it was about the the corporate response using him who's a real person right. as the folly of their jokes. And That's sweetly, what he was saying about like um the like Duracell thing that she was re uh, Ariana recorded in their house. Yeah. Um he was like they were making jokes about nail polish and batteries everything that is me right and i'm like batteries are part of the pillar of your soul i didn't know he was such a battery guy until he <laughs> said that but he really identifies with those and uh, then, duracells yeah and then it took like a kind of a dark turn which then left me feeling like icky and sad at the end where he said that around that time when she was doing all those ads and he was just like a, the pria of earth that he made kyle chan come get the guns from his house because yeah, he was I, so in a dark place yeah. and i'm like oh my god like i mean that's what i was talking about back then where i was like you guys like i swear to god you were like very close to having like one or two deaths on your hands like you have to stop what's number two <laughs> rachel oh oh right oh right. like she oh. literally had to go to like she had to go away oh yeah yeah no 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 i i, I think <laughs> i mean 
That's I, mean, uh, I don't know. I, I, I if if I even say one thing in defense of Tom Sandoval, it's like goodbye turtle time. We'll never do another show again. And I'm not going to defend. Well, I think him. there's I, a difference between like defending him and being like, do ex- you want him hung in the public? We square? said that we said when we were talking about the reunions, we were like, the one thing they weren't saying is is you should right now go die and die in a hole and let's never you know what I mean? Like it was the one thing that was too much to say was just that everyone wanted him dead basically and i just think that talking about parasocial or whatever like is that that's the word right Mm -hmm. when you have an unhealthy obsession with someone that you don't know yeah this is bordering (sighs) on too much hate for a person we don't really know i I, yeah that's that i think we have to agree on that and um as fans of this show, we feel so attached to them and people can see them in the real world. So it adds this whole whole other layer, right? To it, you know, where it's like they're, they're more approachable in our lives, but still, I just think that, um, there's just almost an unnecessary amount of hatred still for him to the point where people can't even watch one isolated clip of him saying, I like white nail polish and not be like, this is the most (laughs) despicable man on earth. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, not really a defense, but it's just a recalibrating of how much hate he should receive. And everything he said was wrong and misguided on that. But I could see what in his mind he's trying to articulate when he talks about Sweet Lady Jane Cakes. I can see the, I speak Tom Sandoval because I've been watching <laughs> him for 10 years. Yeah. I know that language and I know what he means. And I know, and Schwartz knows what he means. Schwartz yeah. is almost having to interpret these callous things that he's saying yeah. by making them more audience friendly. Yeah. And I feel like, um, I, I don't, that's just, I just felt like, guess the reaction to that interview and Nick Vial's stance of being this person who hates Tom Sandoval just felt so fake and phony and lame that it just made the whole interview uh, uncomfortable for me to listen to. Yeah. I just, I didn't like it. I wish that um, there was, I wish that, that he had a forum to go on that would be, have a little more nuance. That's there's somewhere in between Howie Mandel yeah. and Nick Vial. Right. I'm sorry. Right, right. There is, there were a much better outlet, but no, proper outlets care enough to ever interview him in a in a thoughtful way he and needs oprah yeah I, I, well he wants oprah and, and there is and there and he wants oprah he wanted he wanted big time uh like the view he wanted yeah. huge but they're not gonna do God, it the view would eat him alive the view would eat him alive um I, i'm just saying i don't know there's there's that's my thoughts it's, it's not very i don't really have yeah i think uh, it's hard because yeah there's only either um coming for him completely or like Bethany or whatever that's yes. questioning the Ugh. existence of the show and how toxic it is. Yeah. And I'm like, is there like somewhere in the middle that's like you can ta- like keep him, up, him on the hook for what he did and that it was bad in just like a basic human level of, you know, cheating yeah. or whatever. But then also talking about like the public response and how hard that was because it was so insane and unexpected without totally uh you know ruining the fun of reality tv at the same time yeah if only there was this outlet that was sort of (laughs) lighthearted, but also objective but knowledgeable and could ask really insightful questions without being too mean-spirited but also get to the heart of some deep (laughs) things i don't know what kind of outlet that is it sort of feels like i don't know is there any like beautiful podcast like that but if there is that would be great to possibly i don't know i just this was not overall this was a, a, a failure in my mind and i was I was bummed out that I felt compelled to listen to Nick Vial's uh, podcast. Yeah. I did enjoy when Schwartz brought up Gypsy Rose, though. Yeah, that was cool. (laughs) That was, I like that Gypsy Rose, that that was at the hikes. I think this was like three weeks ago because they had just got back from Thailand. So that was Gypsy Rose fever. Yeah, he said, uh, I think he described her as having a glow up. He said that? Yeah. Schwartz said, yeah. Gypsy Rose, I mean, that's true, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was like, man, is my episode coming out right after Gypsy Rose? I can't compete with that. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> classic, um, Schwartz. What's that called when you undercut yourself? Um, like humility, <laughs> right? Yeah. His classic aw shucks. Yeah. That's aw shucks. Um, but I thought he came off very well. Shorts. Yeah. yeah he's he always great. like more articulate than I 
think, he's especially good. next to Sandoval. We've said it before. He's secretly smart. He just doesn't like to use his intelligence all the time. He, you yeah. know, but he's a smart person. You can tell by his. Uh, he has a way with words. Great way with words. And there was things that he pushed back on. I think he did good in the Nick Vial environment where he goes, "I'm not talking about that." You yeah. know, respectfully. Thank I don't. God want to say he that. learned finally. Yeah. That Remember was- when he was on Watch What Happens, like early days or like right before and he like wouldn't stop answering the questions and Andy was like I'm the one interviewing you and I'm gonna tell you that you can just stop talking and I will move on that's the perfect (laughs) that's the perfect uh example to bring up about how I feel about this Sandoval interview yeah I enjoyed Schwartz's erratic um honest chaotic rambling of truth or what he thought was the truth no no schwartz on oh. watch what happens that's oh. what you're talking about right yeah sorry i, I thought you switched really back. really loved that watch what happens live <laughs> appearance it can compared with some prepackaged garbage where someone is sure, tight-lipped but and, there's a difference between being entertained by someone uh potentially like not making a fool of themselves but like fucking up their life with their answer like but we he, enjoy watching that but it's also like, but you're like, why are you doing this? Yeah. I want them to do that. <laughs> I get I get by someone in your back of your head, you're saying, how could this happen? Why would someone do this? Why would they give us this fun, freewheeling conversation with no um, limits? But as a viewer, an audience member, and someone who we, I think we have come around on Schwartz, we, we started to forgive him, wasn't like... Don't you appreciate uh, open honesty and, and sure. the, the chaotic? Sure, but then we'll watch later why uh, Katie doesn't talk to him anymore because of what he said. Yeah. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I Like he finally this time was like, I don't want to answer that because we're in a really good place. I'm like, you've learned. Like, that's not entertaining. I want him because like he started to sort of talk shit about Katie and say that she's really judgmental. Uh and I was like, oh, shit, is he going to pop off? And then he was sort of like, I mean that in a good way. And then he was like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that moment. Um, if- also, do you get the um, impression that maybe, um, similar to like Olivia and Austin, that maybe Katie's meaner to Schwartz on camera than in real life? Yeah, I think so. I think I think that is, I, I think that is more of their dynamic, you know, a little sort of, uh, what's that called? Like, uh, yeah, like how Katie treats him now is like probably representative of how she treated him in the r- relationship for the most part. Yeah. Uh, but are you saying like, was that their vibe the entire time? Like, I don't know, like on the new episode when she comes to pick up the dogs or whatever. And he's like, I mean, obviously they were intending to film a scene together. So it was bullshit anyways. But he was like, do you want to hang out for a little? And she like rolls her eyes and is like, oh, sure. And it's like, I feel like she can't let the public think for a second that she enjoys his company. I think so. Yeah. But then in, in reality, she's more, um, what, what, like, um, would po- po- like have the opposite uh, reaction or, or like want to spend time with him. Yeah. Or maybe that's just how she, I mean, has always been. Like, I mean, Lala said on Watch What Happens and you, like, she was like, yeah, that's their dynamic. She treats him like shit and he loves it. <laughs> that's what Lala said yeah I think yeah I think that was a dynamic that worked for them and um I, but I was gonna say just because you said Schwartz was starting to say Katie is judgmental or whatever like when he started to say that if we heard Schwartz say he continued on and said the things that Katie was really judgmental about in the past or times she was wrong I, I mean would we start to fault Schwartz for saying honest things about what or would we just factor Some that people into people would right right so <laughs> That's where I'm at. I guess it's like, do we want pe- Bravo celebrities or celebrities or anybody to bite their tongues because of what the reaction of a twenty percent? That would be that's like us on Turtle Time. I'm, I I want to be honest with my feelings and and yeah. and not ever have a a lukewarm take because that I don't believe because I'm trying to. This is what I'm doing right now. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's like we. I think there is some value to being honest and being truthful and not. Uh, being reserved with your opinions and thoughts if you really believe it, you know, for the most part, I, I think that's true. Yeah. And so I don't know. That's just what this, all the, these interviews and conversations had me thinking. Yeah. I just feel like compared to everyone else, like every other person on Vanderpump Rules, past and present, 
uh, talks into a microphone nonstop 24 seven. They mm-hmm. all have a podcast. They all go on each other's podcasts. They go on Amazon live. They go on everything. They talk all the time. And I think Sandoval is um, maybe the worst at it as a podcaster. Yeah. Worse than Rachel. <laughs> uh, well, I guess in different uh, ways, because Rachel is like, uh, her show is so uh, constructed around her. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Sandoval, I don't listen to his podcast, but just speaking as a, a guest on this episode, just like so all over the place. I would just hope that if I went through something like that, that I would have some like really good takeaways almost a year in of like soul searching. I'm not saying that he needs to repent or like have the perfect answer or whatever, but he really had almost no insights whatsoever. He just was harping on like that when uh, his parents, his step parents and Ariana's parents got divorced, that one of them kept the house. Like he was glomming onto these tiny little details that he thought would exonerate him and they were worthless. Like they didn't work or hold up at all right and it was just like you're just not good at this like you're not convincing me like if he came in with just some strong points of like i don't know broader examples of their relationship falling apart and like whatever or like the isolation that he's been living in for the past year and like just anything that would be eye-opening at all but he really was just going for these little nitpicky details that fell apart and also nick Vial like had no patience for them whatsoever and like was like anyways and then he would try to bring them up again he said that thing about the keeping the house two times he was like when my parents got divorced my dad kept the house and then when my step parents right. got di- like whatever and then he he went through like it took like a minute to explain all three scenarios and then when they like didn't spend any time on it he said the whole thing again <laughs> And I was like, well, you literally just said that. Right. <laughs> yeah. I. Um, <laughs> and I'm I like, why do you think that exonerates you? Like, that's irrelevant. I know that that's in your mind what you're thinking of why you should get to keep the house if you want to. But there's another person that doesn't want you to have it. So it right. doesn't fucking matter. Right. It's, it's <laughs> uh, yeah, sort of a no win unless he just didn't articulate his actual thoughts which are abhorrent to some people so it's like he couldn't really win in that scenario i think he decided to be honest and almost embrace a little bit of villainy or at least just his side of things (laughs) sure and double down yeah it's just like his side is so immature a lot of the time where he's like i put in tens of thousands into that house to build a custom gym and now if i move i have to buy build another gym and it's like no one gives a fuck that you spent 10 grand on a gym and that you have to build another one like who fucking cares like are you kidding me like (laughs) i understand that that's annoying but like that's just the fucking facts of life bro so maybe keep that sort of small potatoes shit out of the conversation because i mean it was funny to me but like it's not a good talking point if you're trying to defend yourself okay (laughs) yeah yeah well we should wrap this up my thoughts are that it didn't make me think of tom sandoval any worse when he started to say these like things that can be construed as horrible and him being petty in a way you know he's also being petty in his own way um but I, I don't, yeah, I guess I just don't know if this interview or any interview is ever going to be the outlet in which Tom Sandoval can be redeemed. So maybe that goes to your point where it just don't say anything for a while. Don't podcast. Let Vanderpump Rules be your judge and jury, you yeah. know, your performance there and see if the audience comes back to you instead of digging yourself into a hole every single time you get the opportunity. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, like, look at Schwartz was saying that he had to give up a sub 3% interest rate. Like, that is like that hurts worse than anything worse than your fucking gym you'll never see that again in our lifetime he said like that. yeah that's fucking crazy like that's like insane that's right. like the best thing ever and like he just was mature and was like we're getting divorced so we're selling our house and we agreed to do it and it was really sad and it sucked but like yeah that's the fucking facts yeah tom sandoval was a little petulant um and exasperated uh, during this time so he said things it was almost like his when he got exasperated at the reunion and he said yeah i was so hot 
uh, having sex with <laughs> right. you in your t-shirt when he like it led to like the worst outburst because he was like right. frustrated and defeated. And I think Nick got him to a defeated place where he just started saying any shit that could possibly justify his behavior. Um, yeah. And I, what I, I get, I don't know. The fact that we can talk about this for almost thirty minutes is maybe it is a very <laughs> powerful conversation, and I'm thinking more about it. You know, I don't know yeah. than I even thought I would. Yeah, I think it made to me it made Schwartz come off very well I in was comparison. Already, yeah, I was already in the tank for Schwartz. You know, for uh, sure his post his post uh, height of Scandaval. Once we got the once he loved our Coors Lights at um oh, yes. at Tom Tom and he bought us all a shot. I was sort of like Schwartz, you just bought my my um opinion of you back. Yeah, um, but. I don't know. It was interesting, certainly. Um, it just kind of bums me out. Like it bums it, me it's out just too. kind of a bummer. Like he's just like clearly still struggling with it all. He's kind of like spiraling out. I think he's gonna have a midlife crisis for like ten entire years, if not just through the rest of his life. Like I don't see him growing really, which I'm not looking for growth from Vanderpump Rules cast members necessarily. Um, but it's kind of just like sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it, it, uh, it could give sad, I think. Um, and yeah, I just, I guess my opinion wasn't swayed of Sandoval and I don't know if it ever will be, but it would probably be from watching how he acts on Vanderpump rules and not like his podcast or him, his appearances on podcasts. I know I'm, uh. Yeah, I, I'm curious to see how he'll be deployed this season since we didn't really get a peek yet. Yeah. Did we talk about Rachel Goes Rogue enough? Besides the producer's <laughs> fingerprints, uh, you know, that are sort of uh, guiding Rachel through Vanderpump Rules. Yeah. Which we just said could be unique to her experience. It's very likely. Yeah, that's it's... how I felt listening where I'm like, yeah, I don't think that really happens to anyone else, at least to that degree. She's 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 still grappling with her version of things and what she feels like she was in chapter five she said something like when she got to guys night which was like she had to tell you know uh, lala and everyone that she's going to guys night and she said that tom sandoval gleamed at her with big bushy bright eyes i don't know if you got to that part and she goes she found out later that he was possibly alerted that she would be coming there so then she thinks that he heightened his reaction to seeing her to for the cameras right. so that she would think that he was really happy to see her. Like, I, I didn't understand yeah. why she was trying to parse the reality of that. I think Sandoval liked Rachel at this point, whether he was attracted to her or he just liked her as a person and thought it was fun. That her what, Charlie... How would that behoove him on camera to be excited to see her? No, if anything, he, he found out, he's like, I like this person now. I'm sexually attracted to her. I'm not going to make a big deal when she arrives. Right. Did you like his comment about how uh, he was like, me and Ariana didn't have sex for a year, and then this uh, chick comes in and uh, does the uh, the whipped cream bikini, and then he's like, you know, from um, Varsity Blues. <laughs> I was thinking not another teen movie. Did well, you ever see that? Same difference. The parody of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was an intentionally provocative statement. He definitely had it prepared, right? Like, yes. It was such a specific example. It was, and it was very demeaning to Rachel. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the worst things he said. Do you think she really did that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I immediately flashed to uh, envisioning that, not in a weird way, but just because he, he painted the, the picture. But yeah, I think he arrived uh, outside of his house that night, um, you know, before they made love because she was wearing full whipped cream. No, I think he just meant, he meant right. how sexually enticing Rachel was to him, which I felt was a low blow. That, that Rachel at this point like was she so was... was throwing herself at him. Uh-huh. That's how I read it. Uh-huh. Not that she literally put whipped cream sure. over her naked body. Right. Yeah. I, I thought I, I thought that was I thought that was a little rude, and that's why I was like, "Are you digging in? Are you being? Are you digging in on being the heel here a little bit? And like, right. like, because there were some statements he made that you absolutely did not have to say. Yeah. And it only had to be because you're truly thinking it, and you wanted to. You you were so confident in your take that you think some people will love it. Or do you just are you embracing a little bit of this bad boy right. <laughs> image? Like, yeah. I don't know. I, I didn't know where the line was. The varsity blues thing. That sounded like that sounded bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I wonder what she thought when she heard that. Um, yeah, it just felt like he was like plucking from all over the place. And then there could have been like a deep 
and sad moment about like his friend who died that comes up in the premiere and he was immediately like actually that is why i was late <laughs> he said that <laughs> yeah he was like i cried all night that's why i was late oh wait, is it like the one year anniversary um not yet oh, i think it, it was may you, he said oh sorry he said, said that the night before they recorded he thought about his friend's death oh. and cried for hours and he was like that is actually why i was late even though when he answered the phone in the morning he was like oh hey what's up yeah well, i totally <laughs> missed that moment okay so he tried to give some nuance to why he was late or add, um, add some rationale yeah and it's like if he had any depth to anything he was saying i would give him a mile for an inch like i really would like if he was like he sort of said over the months, like, I was drinking too much, like, I was partying, like, whatever, like, I was stressed out because of the bar. But it's like, if he's, like, truly in therapy, like, don't you think a year in, he would be like, I've really lost my sense of self these days. Like, my relationship was failing. I was in over my head with debt. Like, I was just parting to do anything to not think about my impending doom or like aging or yeah. like whatever like just any clarity on like his mental state and i feel like he just talks about going to therapy but then he like every time they're like what have you learned he goes what have i learned and then you're like yeah what have you learned he goes what have i learned what haven't i learned <laughs> Wow, the feeling when you uh, got through therapy and you aced it, right? It's like, what didn't I learn there? Um, he did say uh, one thing I just that just came out to me is that he did say something that everyone will sort of be on his side about, which this was like, this was perfect. He said um, he didn't tell Ariana that he was cheating and that he wanted to leave because he thought he, for sure she has her confessionals to film for Vanderpump Rules. So it would be horrible to break up with her so that she would have that in mind when she was doing her confessionals talking about earlier scenes. Right. I thought, okay. Well, I, I, sorry. That's why I'm sort of defending Sandoval because that was the perfect explanation for why he didn't tell her. Right. I guess. No, it, I'm just kidding. It was, it was that is that's I mean, that that is being so producer minded that you're letting that was it was just total bullshit yeah you're letting you're letting your your view of vanderpump rules completely alter decisions you make in life which is like right. the exact opposite of what you should be doing what do you think they would have done if he would have told her before they were done like would they, they have worked it in yeah yes uh, yes they would have they would have not let ariana do confessionals where she just learned this <laughs> or do you think she would take it to the grave and just work her way through it because she's sad, anyways. Uh, yeah, you no, know, it was it was a total excuse. It was a total excuse, like him uh, saying he was crying about um, his friend Ali. I think his yeah. name is about about being late. It was a total. I've had time to think about this. This is another justification because there's that was that was ridiculous. I mean, I think that was another example of you think this is uh, providing some explanation that is actually horrible or worse yeah. than you ever thought it and would come off. The fact I kind of like forgot that like. He was cheating while they were in couples therapy. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah. like, that sucks so bad. I mean, the details are h horrible. I mean, we haven't even, we, there's details that we're not even saying, which I don't want to get into, that are even worse yeah. about this entire thing. So there's no explanation anymore that he can, you know, really give. Yeah. It's, it's just no one is going to buy because the decisions that he made, there's no excuse for why he didn't say before he started to cheat. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. With like the Rachel's side of it, it's just so weird to yeah have them both just talking about it still. And Rachel, she keeps just like answering questions that are, have already been covered on yeah. that very show. And I'm like, we're only on the fifth episode. Why do you already have to re-answer these questions? Like it was like about like, did you give your dog to a no-kill shelter? And I'm like, she did like a whole episode about the dog. Like yeah. I know every detail about yeah. that already. Yeah. And, and also like, I don't know, like how, <laughs> like haven't you just compiled the 50 best questions and like that's what the whole series is going to be? It sounds like they, each episode is like new questions that come up. It's like this this can't just be a Q&A podcast for five or six ep episodes. Right. Like either, there has to be – I, I don't know. What did I, you think about what she said about Sheena and the restraining order and that like she really only had it f as a like act of protection to have, but she didn't intend to serve it. But then TMZ looked it up uh, and reported that she had one. And so then it caused them to have to like go to court or whatever. But she was like, I just had it as a backup. And she was like, I didn't know how any of that worked. And I'm like, it seems like 
uh, she really just keeps getting in trouble because she doesn't know how anything works well, and that people around her guide her poorly. How do you file a backup um, restraining I don't understand. Order? Do you have to like, you can file one but not serve one? Is that I, what she was saying? I mean, but yeah, I mean, you still filed one. I mean, I don't right. know. That was another example of you gate, you, you think this provides some clarity and absolves your decision and it sounds even worse i was like what that's her and sandoval are the same they they give unnecessary and confusing details like she then went back into the thing about staying with sheena's cat because of the mercury treatment or whatever which i still don't even know if that is a thing like i (laughs) i think i think now 80 percent of the time Rachel is being honest, like fully honest, and there's some stuff she doesn't want to go into, and then 20% of it is that she doesn't have an accurate read on the situations that were happening around her. Either she just didn't understand at the time or is still trying to parse what people meant when they said things. Yeah. Because there, there's a lot of searching right. on this podcast. It's like of, when she's talking and says things out loud, it's like you need someone right there to be like, is this what you meant? Do you mean this? Like she was saying when she went to the Meadows um that someone in her group she was like someone in my group accidentally texted their friend that i was there and i was like they accidentally texted their right. friend or you just mean they um carelessly right. uh right. told a friend right. or you right. know what i mean and like, that friend told the media right she's like somehow it got out and i'm like are you yeah just the dumbest person it's little baby of, girl it's yeah it's it's sort of there's a little bit of an unreliable narrator to all this this stuff both of them like you said yeah. there is a lot of there is a lot of maybe um, they were perfect can, can, yeah. <laughs> they were like goals <laughs> just like lobotomized in heaven they would just have, like I rolling mean, around in the hay yes with no brain we said well no you know I don't, i'm not gonna go that far um i mean it definitely brought up a good mental image but um i i think that well i don't know i don't know what i was gonna say just that just that they did have this like fairy tale ending that they wanted where like tom sandoval would break up right after the reunion is that what he wanted right I think after so. he wanted the full season 10 arc to end yeah. with this not coming out then tell ariana and then have rachel be his new girlfriend on season 11 right yeah i think so uh they almost made it it's crazy that think, like yeah it was like give or take a few weeks yeah maybe you're right that the the overall analysis of these two disparate things is that we're overhearing the odds and ends and scraps of Scandaval and it's time to shut the book on the extraneous Scandaval shit and yeah. just focus on the future and yeah. what we've learned and what we've grown past and maybe that's a way to I don't know shut the book on <laughs> season 10 now, I won't say Scandaval because you still have to reckon with Scandaval but shut the book on the unanswered questions from season 10 because I feel like we have everything answered. Yeah. Someone can make a burn book with all the details and then we'll close it. Yeah, that sounds good. Speaking of burn books, did you hear that Monica Garcia said that that burn book actually had way cooler pages in it, <laughs> but they didn't get to them on the reunion, but it was actually way better of a prop than we give her credit for? They should upload the pages to the, the public she, library. She should. Yeah. She should. If there's such better pages, yeah. show us. Uh, Andy said he wants it for BravoCon. He did? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. That'd be awesome. I mean, that's just like a slam dunk. Oh. I wonder if it's automatically contracted that any props you bring to reunion have to be uh, surrendered for BravoCon. I think so. Any props you bring to the reunion, that has to be a new clause where it says we have all rights to this prop. They should have like a library at BravoCon where a white glove person shows you and opens each page i would just like if you were looking at a like a shakespeare shakespeare's a first folio or something yes but i've said this before i get that old book uh, collector on tiktok and he says that you don't wear gloves oh because they have it's, some it, it makes it i think it's too slippery like you're more likely to drop it and do damage than just to use your hands i guess okay wow i i want to follow that person you don't touch the morgan letters with your, you don't touch it with gloves, right? <laughs> well, I was just watching that episode the other day, and they were all like, "Sonia, that shit was fake as fuck. Like, please calm down." Those le- <laughs> those letters were recreations. That's what they were telling her. I don't know if they were just trying to get her not to freak out, but they were like, "Yeah, it did not look real." Did they ever say what he was writing in those letters? <laughs> I don't think so, but uh, yeah, I forgot how cuckoo Sonia goes in the that Morgan house. She gets really upset. It, were, they were J.P. Morgan's letters. Or a, uh, or, a, or a descendant. 
it was I don't think it was JP but it was yeah one of the family and then they implied that a lot of the Morgans were married to each other oh well that's <laughs> I mean I understand um did, you said that JP Morgan's brother <laughs> wrote um Jingle Bells Jingle Bells right <laughs> Jimmy told me that oh okay yeah. Jimmy told so there, if, but if the letters probably don't concern. Like, what if that's what it was? Hey, I heard your new song. It was like, dearest brother. <laughs> dearest brother, I have just heard the new song you created, you sent me, <laughs> or you had the caroler sing to me. Jingle bells, you called it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. It's a Christmas miracle. It's, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I wanted to, if you, if I, this was longer than I thought we'd ever talk. I feel I feel adrift with my take. Were my takes too outside of the norm of turtle time? Or was I just, I think I had to talk to you to process my feelings. To get back on track. Is that okay? I was isolated. I was adrift. I lost myself. And then I talked to you and I feel exactly how you do. Is that okay? We feel how every listener feels. (laughs) I feel how you feel. I thought about it and I feel how you feel. And anything I said contrary to what you think is wrong. Right? Is that okay? Yeah. Don't be mad at us, turtle cuties. We have to parse out our feelings. Yes. Um, Let us parse. But yeah, we'll get back into this whole thing. I feel like on when we talk about the new episode yes. just now, we'll talk about where Ariana's at and her anger level and how we have to get back on that page again, even yes. though it kind of sucks to have to revisit the dark times i need to get back on that page though and feel how i felt then and process everything through the lens of season 11 and that's that's how i feel yeah now amy i wanted to ask you before we get into vanderpump rules and our recap yeah i wanted to say something i wrote three more pages of the reality of a scandal oh, wow. and i wanted to see would you ever permit me to read them as quickly as humanly possible to you and if it completely <laughs> sucks we'll cut it out Yeah, and now I I realize, I think you are so sensitive about Sandoval because you've been writing from his POV, and it's like how an actor, even if you play a serial killer, you have to understand them. Thank you for saying that. (laughs) It's like when uh, Hans Landa in Inglorious Bastard, the guy who played that character, whatever that guy's name is. Christoph Waltz. Christoph Waltz said that he finds his character endearing, and he thinks there's actually some good in him because he was playing him. That's exactly what it was. So thank you so much for allowing some, um, you know, what is that called? Al- allowing for the truth, of, <laughs> the truth of what happened to well, come out. That's true. I think um, Christoph Waltz won the Oscar for that role. So I know, but I think that characters, actors, can say this character I'm playing is an absolute monster, and I find no redeemable merit. And also, it's no, pretend. you can't get inside the mask that way. But Hannibal Lecter. Anthony Hopkins was insane. He's a baller. I, who? <laughs> Hannibal Anthony. Lecter. He's awesome. I He's love a man Hannibal of Lecter. the world. He's like a bitchy queen. He likes to wear flesh and eat it, but he's funny. <laughs> right. No, no. I love Hannibal Lecter, and I think he's fun, and I would, I like him, and I would be friends with him, and I don't think we would ever offend his sensibilities where he'd want to eat us. I'm just saying. Yeah, he have... would be like, you guys are cool, actually. Yeah. Right. He would love us. I could imagine. I'm just I'm... kidding. He would read us for filth. He'd be like... Your mother didn't breastfeed you. You're disgusting. I would. I think there's truth to what you said, but I would never offend him. If he came wearing that um, mask or whatever, and we were able to get him out of the penitentiary to sit with us, I would not offend him. Right? No, because the thing is, we would capture him in his like Panama hat era after he gobbles up that. um, Ray Liotta. Uh. Isn't that a, a different movie? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, you oh, skipped oh, oh, to a different oh, sorry. chapter. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not to digress. I was thinking about Hannibal, the Ridley Scott film. You're talking okay. about the very end where he sees um, that uh, shitty um, therapist or whatever. No, no, he's or the, the, he's the, the warden. He's yeah, the uh, yeah, the, the like director psychotherapy. The, yeah. Cri- Crichton. I don't remember, but he, it's clear that he's going to go eat him, but yeah. he's wearing like a linen suit and a Panama hat and he's like about to go enjoy the rest of his life. And you're like, yes. Well, you know what he <laughs> says that makes you know that he's possibly going to eat him. He goes, I'm having an old friend for dinner. <laughs> it's the best. And then she's like, Hannibal, like Dr. Lecter, <laughs> hey, Dr. Lecter, um, Silence of the Lambs is I literally top five of my favorite movies. It's goaded. But it's so good and so popular that it almost makes you doubt its its uh, 
greatness. No, that's like the it's best kind of movie where it's beloved by the popular culture and it's the it's bomb. Perfect. It's my favorite movie. It's like The Godfather, where it's like I don't even need to feel embarrassed about loving Silence of the Lambs. It rips so hard. Well, speaking of Hannibal <laughs> Lecter and that, I wrote two more pages of Reality of a okay. Scandal, and I'm going to read this quick. R- okay. Quick as hell, but just. You can stop me if you have any questions, okay? Okay. Okay. So um, it was title card, The Reality of a Scandal. Last last week, that's what it said. Mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. is right after the title card. Okay. Okay. Fade in. Interior. Tom and Ariana's house, day. Ariana sits alone at the kitchen island, still tired from a rough night of sleep. She's playing an episode of her favorite podcast out loud on her phone. She laughs. But even the humor of a very good podcast can't overtake her feeling that something is wrong. She looks over at the espresso machine and then out at the backyard. Through the glass, we see Tom Sandoval sleeping outside on a patio couch using a pool noodle as a pillow. Ariana gets up and opens the back door. Ariana, Tom, wake up. Tom wakes up slowly, still in the throes of a deep sleep. Tom, hey, Dumplin', good morning. Ariana, I'm not Dumpling this morning. Tom, Ariana, I'm sorry. Ariana, I've been hearing that a lot lately. Tom, we went to the Abbey after you left. A few people came up to me with shots. I got a little lost in the vibe. Ariana, you were already lost in the vibe at Tom Tom. You've been lost in the vibe for months. Tom, you're using a noodle as a pillow. Tom looks down at the noodle, barely able to open his eyes. He smiles at how ridiculous it looks. Tom, the door was locked and I think Guillermo took my keys. I should have listened to you last night. Once I untangle myself from this pool noodle, can I make you a dumpling latte? <laughs> Ariana looks at Tom, helpless and hungover, wrapped in a pool noodle, and softens toward him, against her better judgment. She doesn't answer, but walks back inside and leaves the door open for him. When Tom is alone, the smile drops from his face and concern takes its place. So a little, just so you know, that's getting us back into the world of, of Tom and Ariana's yes. house. Okay. Interior, next scene. Interior, Turtle Time Headquarters, day. <laughs> Turtle Time Headquarters is bustling with activity. Employees rushing around the room, hunkered down at desks, typing frantically, and there's the occasional laugh at a joke well told. The office layout is completely open except for two offices near the back of the room. Interior, Amy's office, day. Riley walks in with his laptop. Riley, did you see page six? Amy, I've already seen page seven. (laughs) Riley, then you want to go with the Hubbard story? Amy, (laughs) Riley, we just found out her middle name is Ron. Lindsay Ron Hubbard. (laughs) Riley. All right, I'll take the leap with you. Do you have a few minutes? Amy nods for Riley to close her office door. (laughs) She does. Riley. Amy, what happened last night? Amy. I chugged a bottle of wine, watched two episodes of Sex in the City, and passed out. What about it? (laughs) Riley. You know what I mean. Amy, serious now. I don't know what that was. (laughs) But I haven't felt a shimmer that strong since we started Turtle Time. (laughs) Riley. Not since he showed us how to control it. Riley (laughs) looks... It's making me cry. Riley looks at Amy expectantly. (laughs) Amy. Riley, no. Riley grabs Amy's coat off the coat rack and hands it to her. Riley. We have to tell him. Amy. God damn it. She gets up and follows Riley out of her office. Exterior, freeway overpass, day. Various cars speed past, you know, on the freeway. <laughs> Exterior, <laughs> under the freeway overpass, day. Amy and Riley poke. <laughs> Amy and Riley park their motor- motorcycle near a large tunnel under the freeway. <laughs> <laughs> they make sure <laughs> they make sure no one is around, and then they walk into the tunnel. Interior tunnel, day. Amy and Riley walk down the tunnel until they reach a large expanse. Someone has made this part of the tunnel their home. In the corner, shrouded in shadow and garbage, is Cedric. He looks sort of like Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now. Note, Cedric is played by Robert De Niro. We are able to offer Mr. De Niro a lot of money and can shoot his scenes out in two days. Cedric stands up slowly, letting the garbage fall off of him. Cedric, my prodigal children return. How long has it been since thine eyes have seen you? Amy and Riley, in unison but with no cheer. Hi, Dad. So, anyway, I started crying. Like Lisa Cedric? You know what? So, <laughs> but older. <laughs> Here's where I'm at in the writing process, and this would be good. I don't, I don't know how much you want to talk about it, but I thought it would be good 
if our mentor slash whoever the Robert De Niro character, our huge stunt right, casting, right, right. huge cameo is, was our father. Okay. And also had, you know, it, actually that part's up for debate, but I want them to be tied to the Vanderpump rules or slash Beverly Hills universe. Okay. So for a second, I thought maybe it's Ken Todd and we find out that we're Ken Todd's children from a previous marriage but then oh. it doesn't make any sense why ken todd is sleeping in a tunnel with a bunch of garbage surrounding him so i wanted to for cedric it could either be as of now it could be just the name of our mentor slash who guided us through our turtle time shimmer our mentor or it could be cedric possibly after he was shunned from lisa and ken's house he now there's some connection He's a to vagabond him. He's sort of a vagabond, but we learned that he had this power or, you know, what we learned some power from him. So anyway, okay. it was kind of open-ended. I wanted okay. to see what you thought about That's that. That's interesting. I forgot about the supernatural elements. You did? Uh, a little bit. Oh, okay. Well, we, <laughs> sorry. Well, in this scenario, you and I have something sort of like the force called the shimmer where we're able to or tell. Or the shining. Or, or so, yeah, sort of like the shining. It's giving um, Dr. Sleep. Yeah, exactly. This In this universe, you and I have telekinetic powers that we learn from this person who we're just visiting now in the tunnel. Can I wear a steampunk top hat like Rose the Hat? I want that more than anything in the world. <laughs> I love Dr. Sleep and I love Rose the Hat. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I don't, I hate to just take your time on this if it's not, if it wasn't beneficial. Did you appreciate those three pages or was it too yeah, long? Yeah, it was good. The pool noodle was a great detail. Um the dumpling latte also i forgot that that was another detail that tom unnecessarily brought up yet again that he made her dumpling lattes um so that's part of the lore that he will not drop um do you think our motorcycle would have a sidecar like tom tom so i didn't want to go too on the nose okay. i wanted us to just be cool just so you know i pictured the bronson um underpass oh you did? Yeah. I searched underpasses just to make sure my terminology was correct. <laughs> Close also, to Schwartz and Sandy's. Also, there's a great Halloween uh, in the movie Halloween Ends. Michael Myers lives in a tunnel. Oh, um, yeah. That, that, I saw that. You, you saw Halloween yeah. Ends? Did you yeah. like it? Um, I honestly, I watched it at home and was kind of like... Nonplussed? Uh, I like wasn't really paying attention. Okay. All right. Well, That's why I always see movies in theaters because I can't be trusted at home. Well, I wanted to incorporate tunnels... Uh, you know, and I like that we have this shimmer. Anyway, I don't, we don't need to talk about it, but if you want to, you know, send me any notes on it, and then I'd love okay. to write the rest with you if you ever have time. Great. I'm going to redline the hell out of it. Okay. Is, is there kidding. things that you hate? <laughs> no, no, no. It was good. I liked our, the newspaper atmosphere. Do you think we can incorporate a cartoonist? Yeah, of course. I want Turtle Time Like Zodiac? I, I was thinking, exactly. I was thinking, <laughs> I, don't know, I, was, I was thinking... Facebook early days from social network as sort of this open, like, you know, youthful vibe where people are throwing uh, bean bags around or whatever. Yeah. Like, but also Zodiac is great too. <laughs> I, I like that. More of like a, a, what is that? The 60s or 70s? More yeah. of like an entrenched. Yeah, like newspaper. all the president's men or San Francisco Chronicle. Yeah, type. exactly. I, I like that more than the, than the <laughs> entrepreneurial. I want it to be more outdated and silly. Okay. Okay. I like that. Good. Okay. Well, so was that successful? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're really making progress. Okay. I mean, it's six pages, and we, I, like I said, we only have to write 90 of them, so we're basically right. very close to being done. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so <laughs> now, oh, do you want to take a certified turtle piss? Do you need to go? You don't. I'm on the edge. Okay. No, I'm, I'm on the edge. Um, <laughs> I'm on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to think of the song that says, I'm on the, I'm on the edge. What, what, what um, is it? Well, there's Edge of Glory by Lady Gaga. Oh, okay. I'm on the edge. Yeah, right. I was thinking of another one. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter. I could actually, I could blow through. Okay. And then maybe we can just stop, you know, halfway through for really If there's going an emergency. Long. Yeah. And what's, a, and I have a, you know, I, we already talked about it. I, I think maybe we can keep this discussion to about 45 minutes. Do you think that's feasible for us? We'll see. It, it definitely doesn't seem feasible <laughs> given how much time we've talked about those podcasts and everything, but we'll, we'll try. Okay. Okay. Um, so we are back. Uh, this first episode of season 11 is called Notes on a Scandal, which is that a direct reference to the Kate Blanchett, Judy Dench movie from like 2006? I think it has to be because it immediately felt f uh, like a familiar title to that me. That movie rocks ass. Have you seen it? No. It's Judy good. Dench and who? Kate Blanchett. And it's called Notes on a Scandal? Yes. What's the scandal in this um, uh, scenario? I think it's that Kate Blanchett fucks a student and Judy Dench knows. Kate Blanchett, who is in Tar. Yes. Fucks a student and Judy Dench sees them yeah she either sees or finds out and they they're confidants but it becomes a strange dynamic 
Yeah. Like a potentially like um, maybe queer dynamic between Judy Dench and uh, Kate Blanchett, but one way. And it's, um, it's just like, ugh, it kind of has that like, um, almost like match point energy. Yeah, okay. Okay. Like sort of just like a small little drama. Okay. I like, that. you know, okay. I'll it's watch good. It. So I thought this title was actually good, you know, considering yeah. a lot of horrible Bravo titles, this was good, <laughs> but if it's just a direct reference to a movie, they know that's a scandal. It's kind of an it. obscure movie too. Yeah. But I, I did like it. Notes. Was it notes on a scandal? Yeah. Well, before we get, it, before we get into it, cause like we'll go scene by scene and parse through it. But I wanted to ask you like, just generally, like, because this is a big deal. It's yeah. The Vanderpump Rules premiere. Know, can you believe it? No. We already watched it. I, I yeah, I mean, it kind of says something because it's like, I don't know. I have thoughts about this and I'm going to yeah. be very honest, but like, how did you feel? Season 11, episode one, you watched it twice. Yeah. How did you feel overall about this being back in the Vanderpump Rules universe with this episode? Um, You know what? It was kind of like a low key episode, but I kind of appreciated that. I... I don't know that I had the energy for it to be like off with a bang to be like fully dramatic and chaotic from day one. So I kind of liked that it was kind of a chill episode, just like getting you back into the setting, sort of reintroducing you to where everyone's at, where they live, who's cool with who, like they did, you know, some reminders on, um, yeah, like who's blocked on Instagram, who right. isn't talking to who, whatever. And it was kind of just like easing back in, yeah. which I kind of liked. Table setting, right? Yeah. Is that like what that's it was called? just chill. Yeah. I think I have um, over, I over hype premieres for some reason, but yeah. Bravo premieres for the most part are usually like this. Yeah. Slow and steady. And, and you and, saw it at like a raucous party. So it was like Vanderpump Rules starts now. Whereas like I was, I watched it at 5 p.m. on my couch and I was like, la la la. Right. Yeah. So maybe my expectations were high. I'm not saying it was a bad episode. I'm just saying that like for me, I I did like being back with everybody and seeing where they're at now. And there were some fun, you know, moments, but I guess having like the one huge moment be what it was, which we'll talk about when we get to it. That was a a letdown for me. It felt very, you know, artificial, like artificially, um, artificially adding to the drama of this episode so that Mm kind of made it a little more lackluster whereas if it was just all scene setting and then they had ended on a different note maybe i would have took this as um a good sign of what's to come yeah but because well yeah we'll get into it because of what lala did and how i feel about her actions and her motivation it kind of lessened the impact because it's like you had this like slow nice table setting where i'm getting familiar and then you had this one (laughs) dramatic moment that i think was very inauthentic sure so i don't know like overall it sort of overshadows my feelings about the episode right um did you enjoy who got the first speaking line of the episode who was it meow oh kitty kitty ariana's kitty first speaking part of the episode was the (laughs) kitty yeah that's so that is awesome a a lot of people acknowledged or said that there was a lot of cats in this episode three all three tabbies they look the same, all three. Kitty, Mr. Banks, and then who was the third? Uh, Sheena's cat. I don't know if they gave him a lower third, though. Oh, okay. Well, then, no, that was very exciting. I, I honestly didn't realize that it started with a meow. I loved it. That's um, really sweet. Also, we should acknowledge that the first, the intro, the first uh, setting is something about her. It um, was. Despite it not being open. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to handle... Uh, like all of the stuff they're doing towards something about her and having it in the intro and, and how are they going to make like a button on the end of this season without it having opened again? Right. You just know, looking at it that they've, while they talk about it, you're like, they've just spent, I would love to know the actual rent, uh, yeah. For over a year. Right. Uh, and I don't know. I feel like even, uh, Katie and Ariana stands, are starting to be like that place ain't ever opening really you think so i like started to see comments where even the most staunch of supporters are like come on guys <laughs> i think i think it's gonna oh i think it's going to open but this at this point they've waited so long that it can open in june and it's not a big deal and have it as part of the season 12 if there is a season 12 i think right. there will be but um you know why open it now it's right. gonna probably coincide with you know the next time they're filming right yeah, it's just interesting because obviously they started that endeavor thinking it was going to be their bread and butter 
after the show had sort of peaked or whatever. And now it's like Ariana's literally on Broadway. She's been busy for a year straight. She'll probably be busy for another year doing God knows what. And I wonder if they would have pursued this endeavor knowing where they'd be. I mean, Katie still needs it. but You're right. <laughs> you said Katie still needs it. I mean, she doesn't have an alternate plan, I don't think. Um, oh, a podcast. That's disrespectful to <laughs> Disrespectfully, which is the new outlet for Katie and Dana. No, you're right. I actually, what when you just said that, I was like, well, yeah, you're right. That was the the pre all plan for Ariana and Katie. And that would have been their next venture that they focused on even post this show. Yeah. And then now their priorities have completely w- changed. Yeah. And maybe something about her is not the focus for them anymore. That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. It just seems like that's such an all encompassing. Uh, what am I trying to say? Encompassing yeah. business. Um, like opening a bar or restaurant is horrific from what I've heard. Just yeah. so stressful, so expensive, such a small success rate that you really have to want to do it. So I'm like, if you have a billion other things going on, you barely are even home. You've been basically living out of a suitcase for a year. I don't know how you could even physically and mentally deal with opening a new restaurant. I didn't I didn't think about something about her not being at all their main priority anymore. Like I just thought of it as something that they're probably actively thinking about all the time, but you're right. Like yeah. they probably don't think about it like that. And plus there's been so many hurdles they've had to jump yeah. through to get this done that they might be completely over it. Right. I also feel like they are going to hurt through the lens of us being so far away from when this first episode was filmed of them being like, like we hired Nancy Myers production designer or whatever. Like everyone I think is kind of like, yeah, you, how much did you spend on that? And like, it's still not open. So like, I feel like their celebrations of how far they've come with this venture don't read as uh, good knowing this far forward that it still hasn't opened (laughs) yeah you're right i mean yeah and like will the show i'm curious if the show will give them any shade for that all of the airplanes that we'll talk about yeah i mean right i think they (laughs) i think they will because i realized you know re-watching vanderpump rules that like making fun of the cast members through edits is something that they consistently do. I wonder if they would think that the audience is so aligned with Katie and Ariana that they wouldn't give it shade and right. give it all this, like, um, I don't know. But yeah, I, I would right. enjoy that. Just not because I like want them to eat shit and like admit that it's hard or whatever, but just in, in the world of fairness that we spent so much yes. time making fun of Schwartz and Sandys, I do feel they must do the same. Right. And it's real. It's what's really happening. Yeah. It really is taking that long, and it doesn't come to fruition during this season. Right. Um, so, yeah, then we check in with James and Allie, um, and this is where you uh, you had told me about this. I think maybe there was a clip online or something, but um, they show James's new house in Burbank, and he he even goes to far as far to say that it's so quiet here, and then... A plane goes overhead. They do the full shaking house edit. <laughs> but in my mind, uh, like when I saw it at the premiere, I thought that they did a full... I was expecting I thought, I... it to be so much worse from what you told me. I swear the projector like moved <laughs> and it they did the biggest shake. And I really, in my mind's eye, I pictured James going like earthquake happened. But it wasn't as bad as I thought. But it was rumbling with a they little bit of glass. They did have the glass shake. But there's and no way it sounds like that. I'm sure it's not that bad, but it... I'm sure they, they mean, they literally showed planes going overhead in their backyard, right? Or were all the shots of just a plane that I, they specifically... I, I would really like to know. I would want to ask You should James, do a drive-by. Oh, I, I would do a drive-by, <laughs> you know, maybe stop in for coffee with James and just say, do planes actually fly directly overhead? Yeah. Your backyard. I mean, do you look up and they're always going overhead? That yeah. would be rough. I mean, I think they showed at least three separate times. They were really rubbing it in. Yeah, so maybe you're right. Um, And it's a little bit of... But I... I, Like, watching that, I I was just like, I know you want to make fun of him, you know? But it's like... I I don't know. For some reason, that, like... It was like, this is his house. It rubbed you the wrong way. Boy, this is his house. He lives there. He bought 
that. He's very proud of it. Yeah. And you're like, well, look at the shitty house he has to buy. Right. He's under a plane. You know, like, I, I know that they tease the Vanderpump Rules. Sure. But it reminded me of, like, when James was DJing at that festival and he was like, I'm a headliner. And then they showed that he's, like, at the pool and they highlighted his name. It was, like, the very bottom <laughs> name on that flyer. I was like, yeah. there's a certain level of shade that's, like, unnecessary. <laughs> I mean, James is doing good, relatively. It's like uh, that Vanderpump Dogs event where he was like, Please pick up your poo. Please pick up your poo. Yeah, I mean, that's fine because that's the reality. And this maybe is the reality. That was early days. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, whatever. I think I'm down for them to poke fun at all as long as it's everyone. Okay. So you Um, were fine with that. And I'm just, I think I'm maybe just taking it too hard. I felt a little bad that he, that he bought that house and they're like, well, look how much it sucks. Right. Well, I mean, it's still nicer than everyone else lives in an apartment these days. So he wins. Yeah. Um, then Katie visits Ariana. There are like a billion flowers. She was saying how every time she comes over there, it looks like a florist because she's gotten so many flowers in the past two months. Yeah. And this is just after Ariana's birthday. Yes. Which normally, I mean, that shows you that filming is a little later because normally Ariana and Stassi's birthdays were always so prominent, almost like right. five or 10 episodes into production. That's true. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just I, when I, Tom I just... went to bulldoze in Vegas or whatever. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and th- so th- it's revealed that Tom is in New Zealand filming World's Toughest Test, um, which I love having that knowledge that that's where he is. Right. Um, okay, and this is something I need to talk about. Okay. <laughs> okay, so th- they show that they're living in separate rooms, even though like he's gone or whatever. They show Tom's temporary room, which is kind of just like a shitty room. There's not much to it. It looks fine. It's just like obviously a temporary sort of undecorated guest room and you're kind of like oh like whatever and then they show her room and it's an absolute sty right so so. (laughs) like was that shade why did she even let them record in there i could give her benefit of the doubt and say they had to move all their stuff to stay in separate rooms or whatever but it all it just seemed like that's how she lives can you remind me of what um detris or, or whatever the right word is was strewn <laughs> about her and jetsum. What, what jetsum specifically was there was, was just clothes it was mostly clothes it wasn't like mud okay <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't a literal pig pin right but With, there were just clothes everywhere like things hanging like boxes like it looked like what my room looks like when i do spring cleaning and like take everything out of my closet to then put it back in and like give stuff away. Like it was just absolute chaos. Right. And I am kind of like, I think that they kind of just live that way anyways. And we mustn't forget that for most of the time we've known them, they lived in that shithole yes. apartment that always seemed dirty and yeah gross. My take on that is, uh, yeah, production said, can we film your room really quick? She goes, uh, sure, I guess. It's a goddamn mess. Um, and I think that Ariana at this point is barely using her room as a place where she lives because of the um, wildness of her life in this era right now and all the shit that she's doing. So having a clean room wasn't a priority, and I don't think it probably looks like that all the time. I think she's just like, this is like the height of her popularity and she's probably just like jet setting and doing a bunch of different shit. And I think they just caught her room maybe on a bad day, but it's not representative. I mean, maybe. unless I'm I just being too nice and it just looks like shit all the time. You think? I think she might just be a messy girl. Okay. Was it so messy? Well, you're, it sounds like it was, I don't really remember how messy it was. It was quite messy. <laughs> all right. Okay. Maybe she's, okay. Maybe she has a really messy room. Um, yeah. I mean, I kind of get that though. Like that makes sense where, um, If I were to read from the outside in, it seems like, and he tries to tell us that Sandoval said he keeps the house in order. He, you know, keeps the lights on and the toilet paper running and everything. Right. Was that a subtle nod to be like, Ariana doesn't clean her room? (laughs) I think maybe she's the messy one in the relationship. And he seems sort of like anal and like, you know, shaves his forehead and like keeps shit clean because he's kind of like that, you know? Okay. Wow. So I believe it. So, I think let us know. Am I giving her too much too much benefit of the doubt and saying you, they caught her at a messy stage of her you know life, or do you think Ariana is hashtag permanently messy? Right? <laughs> yeah, let us know. Um, oh my gosh! And then this is when we get that hilarious 
texts because she says that they've been communicating through Tom's assistant, Anne. Right. And she texts her, uh, tell him to turn the LED lights off, annoying the neighbors. And then Anne goes, he says the lights fall under freedom of speech, right. which I really think is like instantly iconic. That he said that. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's I mean, like really funny. Yeah. Yeah. It was. I mean, it's <laughs> it's funny. I mean, it's, it's also... Um, He's being a dickhead. <laughs> totally. You know what I mean? But I just love, I want to say everything's freedom of speech now. Right. Like literally everything. Everything is freedom of speech. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think I'm going to be like, they're like, you're getting a ticket. You parked on the wrong side of the street. And I'll be like, freedom of speech. <laughs> I think they would have a hard time <laughs> arguing that what you did didn't constitute free speech. So good. I mean, that was sort of a get out of jail free card, right? They're like, you have to pay for that sandwich. I'm like, freedom of speech. Yeah. I thought that, I thought that was a great way to put it. I also thought it, it played into this this villainous persona, like being petty with her as well. Yeah. Um, and also showed just what a nightmare that assistant has to go through being the mediator. Not horrible. Him. I, I hope she quit. I think he just said he did. I was just going to say that. I think uh, Schwartz, Schwartz just said that they, that, they that resigned. That just resigned. I wonder if it's even the same one this far later. She might have quit The before. stories they would tell if they oh didn't God. want to piss off Ariana or, and Tom. And I know. Just, oh, like a, NDA. like um, Olivia Wilde and Jason Sudeikis' nanny that told all. Yes. That was they, like the best time of our lives. You know what? I didn't really follow it. Oh, it was really fun. All I remember is that like Jason Sudeikis was screaming and crying and he <laughs> laid down in front of the car wheel so she wouldn't drive away from him and... and to Harry Styles with her salad dressing. <laughs> that's the, like the main thing. You get it. <laughs> that That's the That's, that's the like biggest. the big thing that well, he like laid down in front of her tires of her car. Do you think Jason Sudeikis <laughs> is sad? No, I think he's fucking like a 20 year old. Well, you can still be sad and fuck a 20 year old. Tom Sandoval was sad. <laughs> well, yeah, he probably is. Yeah, I just think, okay. Well, anyway, um, so what was the salad dressing part? <laughs> Uh, she was making special salad dressing uh, for Harry Styles. And he was like, I know what you're doing. I know where you're going. And she's like, get out of my way. I'm bringing Harry my dressing. Did he need, did <laughs> Harry Styles admit that he needed um, salad dressing so bad? <laughs> he was like, make me dinner, mama. That's so sweet. They dated? Yeah. I fully forgot about the Harry Styles era. That was like six months where he was the biggest person. He was like how... <laughs> Taylor, well, Taylor Swift was always popular, but <laughs> Gypsy Rose. He, he sort of had a Gypsy Rose moment for about four months. I know. He's been a little under the radar these days. I don't know where he is. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really tap into it too much. I remember when he sort of, it looked like he might have let a little spittle out of his mouth when he right. passed by. Chris Pine. Oh, right. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was a while I followed there. every bit of that. When that was, was that? so fun. When was that? Last. It was like can last year. Okay. Do Whenever you think he is. spit? We never talked about it. We didn't have a podcast back then. Um, Did he spit? It was fun to watch it and think that he did, but I don't think he did. Okay. All right. Um, also, can we quickly say, <laughs> what did you think about Tom saying that Ariana hasn't paid a single bill since the affair? Do you think that's true? No. Wait, wait Tom said that? Yeah. No, no. I think it's. I think that's a hyperbolic statement that... But he said it again later that like part of his stress and why he was so freaking out and like losing his mind and that she was doing the brand deals and everything while not paying the bills like he brought it up multiple times well then N not I mean, the mortgage and not any of the utilities that seems I, I mean i feel like at a certain if they are going to sell the house or do a buyout or whatever i would imagine that you would just build in the unpaid mortgage payments on her end into that deal right right i think so <laughs> i think it's i think there's it's it's between truth and and being hyperbolic maybe there are some bills like the gas bill or i don't know i, I it's like how Lindsay hubbard hasn't paid the rent in their thirteen thousand dollar apartment this whole time i but, mean what do you think because i already def i can't like well that's I, the thing i just i don't know i was surprised to hear that i hadn't thought about that um but in her defense, I guess, she hasn't really been there. Right. And, and and wasn't even living there for like the last, she hasn't been living there like the last three months either. Right. Plus now in New York. That's why I'm, I, that's why I think that she's just using this house as like a place to film at at this point. Like she barely needs to be there. I mean, imagine right. the resources and options she has. Right. That's why I think her room is messy. I think that's why she's not paying bills. It's like I barely live here and you want to live here. Right. Well, that's why I'm just like, I understand why it would benefit him to buy her out because he's already in for it. I don't even know where he would scrounge up the money to 
pay her to buy her out. Like, right. I don't even understand how he could do that. But, like, I don't know. I, I just really think for both of them, they should get the fuck out of there. Like, he should just go get a condo and move on. But anyways, Yeah, he really loves his house. I digress. Yeah. Um, I, I watched the after show. And they were talking about the house and like they were talking about like all the stuff that's going on or whatever. And Ariana said that she thinks that actively, this was like filmed three weeks ago, she thinks that Billy Lee is currently living at their house. Oh, that, shit. That she was like, because <laughs> why does I, that not surprise I me? I think because Sandoval was like complaining about like her having friends at the house or thought that mm. like she would create this zone where all of her friends would say like take over the house or whatever. And Ariana was her counter to that was like, I think actively right now billy lee is living at our house i mean he should collect some rent right like he needs the cash so then so the purpose of this scene is for ariana to justify why she's still in the house to the audience because i think that's one of the biggest questions everyone has even though i've resigned myself to this fact i guess the audience has this question and she says specifically that she does not want him to live in this house after because He's still actively dating Rachel at this point. That's all she knows. They show the lightning postcard. And Ariana says, in whatever, I guess call it petty, call it call it her her morals that are just that she does not want to let him win. Like she's the victim in this scenario. He cheated on her and he does not get to keep the house and then have Rachel possibly move in and then be posting right. selfies. Like he he fully got his fairy tale ending in her house that they bought together. Yeah. So I think She's letting Katie know those details, and it's letting the audience know specifically this is Ariana's moral stance on the house. Right. Yeah. And I understand that stance more as of May when this episode was or whatever, um, and less as of February 2023, but whatever. Not my business. Uh, She also says that Sandoval had the penis flute glued back together, which is kind of insane uh and then they did like a funny they showed a flashback yeah. of logan breaking it in sort of like slow motion and then they like pan in closely and you can see the seam of where it was once broken it now looks like it just a penis vein <laughs> i'm surprised she didn't break it again and just be like fuck you <laughs> do you remember how i would we just all, break it every day do you remember how we all cheered when logan broke the <laughs> penis flute like it yeah. just seems like shocking to relive it's that so world. funny that he was like Oh, we're going to fucking fix that you know, thing. It, it goes to just what we've been saying about the Nick Vial thing. The sticking points in his head, the moral victories that he wants, we just do not think he should be fighting for. And the right. penis flute is a great example. It's right. like, you really love this flute so much and you're so pissed that it got broken by a guest. Yeah, like, you know, he you, like wants to go to court about that. Like, right. he's like, that's my property. Yeah, and it's like, it seems silly to us, but he is so pissed about these little things, infractions that happened to him in his, his life. Yeah. Where do they buy that? Mexico? I don't remember. He, I, I, I barely remember that. I know he, I remember him playing it and it was kind of fun and they were all yeah. doing it, but I don't really remember. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a, another check-in with James and Allie. They're by the pool. They show a plane again. Um, and he's saying how it's funny that he has a pool now and he doesn't need to use Tom's who started to not invite him. Did you notice that when the plane flew by, they edited all the water sloshing out of his <laughs> pool as if an earthquake had happened? It like explodes. No, yeah. Sorry. Well, we, they, they were building furniture, you said? And, oh, he yeah. said, he talked about his where his relationship is with Sandoval now. Yeah, he was saying that he wasn't inviting him to his pool parties, but he doesn't need them anymore. And he then goes, he's saying that uh, Tom has gone cuckoo. Right. And then he goes, I, with his band. <laughs> he's he's the, like the most dismissive thing, which is funny. Like, I'll give him this. He's like, his band, the most extras. I've seen him crying on stage, screaming <laughs> oh out Raquel's name. The, he's like, the montage was hilarious. It. it it, that is something that even Tom Sandoval has to, has to admit. It looks unhinged. The bongo. And bad. <laughs> Raquel! It does seem like a cry for help. We, we've said it. It, it, it was bad. It, to see him with his shirt off, banging bongos, screaming Raquel's name, if you saw that in any other scenario, you'd be like, this person is having a breakdown now. Like, yeah. So I get, I like James. Uh, acknowledging that he that he thinks Tom Sandoval has gone off the deep end. Yeah. What I don't think is true is when Allie says, do you think you could ever be friends <laughs> with Sandoval again? It's like, I, I don't even think Tom Sandoval and James like each other at all. Yeah. At all. I think they've, mo- I, I know for the show, they have to create they've been through it. bonds. <laughs> they've been through it. But like, even asking, does James want to be friends with Tom Sandoval after all of this happened seems like ridiculous so ridiculous to me like it doesn't even need to be asked i think they could have had a great scene without even acknowledging like yeah. possibly 
becoming friends yeah. with Sandoval. Yeah. It's and this is a through line now where the connections to me are becoming so tenuous with the cast members that they're really having to do some work to make it seem justifiable why they would ever want to be friends again. Right. Like why in this world, in this season, would James even think about being friends with Tom Sandoval right now? Right. Why would that even be a question that would be asked? Right. Apart from the fact that they need a bridge to get Tom Sandoval to film with them. Yeah. You know what it did make me think though is that I really never think about the fact that James got fucked over because you really only think about Ariana. Yeah, he didn't um, let it be known. And um, you think of Sheena because she doesn't let us forget it. Um, And you think of the group, but I kind of always forget that I literally like blank out that Rachel is his ex fiance. Yeah. Like I know that's like one of the like main three points of the scandal, but I kind of am just like, that doesn't, occur to me or resonate as important even though it is it's because I, I feel the same way and it's because james has not made a meal out of this he could have milked that thing for if all it it's Sheena. worth yes <laughs> yes because he, yeah he, it's like lala made it about her sheena made it about her like katie kept it pretty chill uh schwartz is like why am i in it <laughs> right, right schwartz wants out of it actively <laughs> And yeah, James could have made it so much more. I feel like James has extremely complicated feelings about how things ended with Rachel. And I hate to say this, I say it all the time, but I think that there is some really bad stuff that happened towards the end of him and Rachel's relationship Mm -hmm. that Rachel is even not revealing yet. And I think he sort of wants to give Rachel a pass for what she did in this equation and is more bummed out by Tom Sandoval, but even not that much like Mm -hmm. not using it as like he is the victim in this more like how could you do this you're despicable like you know what i mean yeah because even when he was popping off at the reunion and like poo poo head and all that it didn't feel necessarily about himself it was just at large he was speaking for the audience yeah yeah. him and lala both we talked about this were like the two like sideline muppet people who just who who were making it not about them but just the audience surrogate screaming at them. They made it more about them yeah. than, than anyone else did, except yeah. maybe Ariana, who was really about. Right. And then, but James is, if he felt very removed from yeah. his personal feelings about that thing, he was just so angry and saying yeah. poop all the time. Yeah. I, I feel like he was even, I mean, this was before he found out, but remember he was even like, can you lay off Rachel? Like, yes, there's, it's enough. He told Lala, he mm-hmm. goes specifically, he told Lala, he goes, lay off Rachel. I think she's had enough. Yeah. He was like kind of, sweet to Rachel and I don't think he gave her his full onslaught of hate because I think there's either some love there or some worry there about how yeah. things ended but you're yeah. right exactly right I forgot about James's equation in there but this scene specifically and it's a through line throughout the episode them trying to like build this group back up I'm noticing a lot of the like producers fingerprints to like make this work yeah and I hope that's not that doesn't continue throughout this entire season yeah I felt like at least for this first one, they were just pairing people off and sort of getting check-ins, you know? Yeah. Um, so then the next one is Sheena and Brock. We see our third cat, third tabby. Um, and they're talking about, they get it out of the way first, which um, Sheena says that she texted yeah. Sandoval about his friend who passed away, who apparently has like low key been in the background this whole yes. time. Yes. Um, a friend from childhood. They showed him in the Tom Tom sidecar. They said um, that he went to Coachella with them, yes. that he was just like very much involved and everyone knew him, which was so sad. And um, kind of like another sad underpinning a la Southern charm where you're like, Oh God, like on top of everything else, there's that happening, which would normally probably be its own like massive, not a storyline, but like really sad moment, but it's kind of just brushed in with the drama. And for the most part, the audience at large does not even acknowledge that this horrible, horrible thing happened to Tom Sandoval during the worst time of his life. I know. I was wondering, I assume that Ariana didn't say anything to him because they weren't speaking at that time, but that's like such a like, I always think about that with like, my mind goes to places like that. If like you have an enemy that you would like never talk to again, it's like if there someone in their life died, yeah. would you reach out anyways? I, I you know what I mean? That. I thought about that too. I, I've been thinking about that recently. Just like I like specifically, I was just like when we, you know, well, maybe I won't get too personal, but I was like, <laughs> I have something in my life that I know is coming, like that's like going to be horrible and grief stricken. And I'm mm-hmm. like, would that be something that like 
would like, you know, yeah, just like what you're talking about, like bring someone back just to give me like an acknowledgement. I'm like, probably not. I know. You know? It's kind it's of like, a weird thing. I just think it's like, if you're written off forever, you know, even if you love them at one time, like, I don't think you need to reintroduce yourself necessarily, but, but it really just depends on how you are as a person and if you think right. that they would really value it but it's it's a hard moral decision to make right it, i feel like maybe for ariana since they were together so long that she was probably close enough to that guy and his family that maybe she just you know she could reach out to his family and not reach out to sandoval i think you know that's probably the case i don't think ariana's pure hatred at this point would have overshadowed the moral decision to comfort someone and i bet a message got to tom in some way from ariana but even if she decided i'm not gonna break my no talking rule about this i don't fully think that makes her like i don't know like it's crazy because i feel like that's such a thing that like if scandival wasn't so bad and like 20 out of 10 like dramatic and just fucked up and fresh like that's the kind of thing where if it was like a lesser grievance or like a lesser betrayal and they were still living in the same house and that happened that's the kind of thing where you like hug each other because it's sad and then you like get back together (laughs) you know what i mean it could have been yeah it totally (laughs) could have been um i don't yeah i don't know that's a good question and like what is that thing that could happen in someone's life that would like bring back your haters to like even you know offer condolences through right. a, a tough time and I, I don't know. know if ariana did that but everyone dropped their it sounds like yeah. most of the cast members dropped their hatred at this point or ost- what's that ostracization mm-hmm. like they they stopped not talking to him to to um you know to reach out at a time when he would be really really hurt and yeah. that's when we learned i just wanted to say one thing before we get to this scene i wanted to do a shout out to uh, sheena's segue in this scene <laughs> which is one of the best segues i've ever seen in my life and i didn't realize how much of a pro sheena is but she goes you know she's sitting on a couch which is like yeah. what somebody <laughs> would do anytime she goes I can't not sit on this couch and think about the last time I had a crazy conversation on this couch with Sandoval. It's like, you guys weren't talking about Sandoval. You know the camera is picking up, so you have to justify a way why you immediately are talking about Sandoval and this loss. So you say, hey, I'm on the couch where I had a conversation with Sandoval. She bent the- over backwards. Then on watch But it's have- a good segue. It's a good segue. Well- Sure. It was slightly, yeah. They On Watch What Happens Live, they asked, they did a poll, like they were doing a bunch of polls and one of them was should sheena get a new couch and multiple people i was with were like what's wrong with her couch and i was like yeah it's like doesn't make sense but i was like sandoval sat on that couch right <laughs> it, it is not a get rid of your couch um the other couch in the vanderpump rules universe they never got over they didn't they didn't even get rid of that couch right um, yeah. um so yeah, yeah this is you were saying before i interrupted you um that just this is when sheena found out in her uh, sending condolences, yes. you know, drop all of the hatred, reach yeah. out, Brock too. They offered a nice text and then Sheena finds out. She was blocked. Block City. Went to Instagram, blocked on her page, Shenanigans page, her sister's page, and now iconically Summer Moon's page, which I think they made good humor of it they showed like a montage of Summer Moon yeah. photos and Sheena's like, how could you block that face? Which like, it's very funny, but I literally see people online being like, wow, like he blocked a baby. And yeah. I'm like, a three-year-old doesn't have a fucking Instagram, you moron. Like it's yeah. the mom's account. No, yeah. I didn't I don't I didn't <laughs> think this was that great or it's just a finsta. Yeah, right. Like no, it's no, a way for he, her to look at his story. Yeah. I I, I yeah. <laughs> I, they they all were making this as a as a you know, uh another reason why he's a monster. It's like, no, he and he explained on the after show. I need He's, to watch that. You should. It's good. Is it's, it like on YouTube? Yeah, they no. They, I think they just started doing an after show for this season. Okay. Um, Tom Sandoval said, "I, I, when I get um, hatred, <laughs> like when Turtle Time was saying, you know, um, we hate you, we hate you." Um, he blocks the account, and then it says, "Any other? Would you like to also block any account that this uh, account is associated with?" <gasps> oh, so Instagram it, does you solid like that? Yeah. So when he blocked us, oh it my said, god, Turtle that's Time. embarrassing. Yeah, I know. So no. if you have a Finsta, they'll find out. So if Monica Garcia would have been blocked by Lisa <laughs> Barlow because she hated her, and it said, would you also like to block Reality Von Tees? It would have been 
game over. Game over. So, so uh, Tom All Sandoval. Right, that's good to know. Yeah. Oh, oh right. I know. Because well, well, I, I was already saying, I should have said this. The one anonymous account that you and I did create, we will, we're going to um, disassociate from that one. For just, you know what I mean? Okay. The, the hate account that we have. Yeah. Uh, I also, by the way, non sequitur i was reading our reviews last night just to tuck into bed and feel good uh but one of uh you know how on apple it'll it'll, you can create a username like on the spot to do a review so they're often very jokey yeah we got one review from someone not a rat not a rat what is that in reference (laughs) to if you don't mind me uh i don't know i feel like they were just being like i'm not a you know i don't know if it was in regards to um monica being a rat or like when we were saying that the hbo executives were doing like fake reviews oh I like- um something like that but i was like um yeah our uh finsta not a rat where we watch sandoval's stories <laughs> right no I, I like that so he justified why he blocked summer moon <laughs> and i accept that and i didn't think it was that uh representative of his character to block summer moon yeah. But that was a huge highlight for people. Like Andy Cohen made a specific reference to that on Watch What Happens Live. I was like, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't I mean, think it's really was... funny. Like, yeah. it's, it's just a funny thing to joke about. Like, when you first told me that that happened, I was like, that's really hilarious yeah. to, yeah. like, have to block a baby. But I understand logistically, and I understand ultimately, but it is funny. It's funny because... <clears throat> bless you. It's, it's funny because it's... Uh, Wait, I also forgot. I wanted to play you a clip of Rachel going rogue. At one point, the producer asked her a question, and someone goes, Achoo! <laughs> <laughs> Which episode? I have to listen to that. The newest one. It's at like 15 minutes and 30 seconds. I remember because I meant to play it. 15 what? 15 30. Wow. A uh, big sneeze. A they didn't big edit sneeze that they didn't edit out. I'm like, you couldn't have fucking asked the question again. What kind of show is wait, wait, this? Wait, well, well, are they taking a page at a turtle time? Or if we I sneeze, we would never edit it out. I, mean, I know, but they have iHeart Studio. They're well, like a real podcast. We've heard that it's iHeart. We have no idea whether it really is. Uh, <laughs> Let me see. Right, well, well, I'll vamp while you get that. Let me um, see if I have it. Yeah, I can't freaking find it. I'm going to try and I'll drop it in if I can. But uh, if you know what I'm talking about, hashtag Achu. So, so <laughs> hashtag Achu, but also I listened to it and I didn't hear the sneeze. So it's very possible that iHeartRadio producers let out a sneeze at it <laughs> where a huge Achu happened and then they replaced the podcast feed. It's and possible I, because I really remember it being 15 minutes, 30 seconds, so, and I don't see it now. So if you listen, if you're a little turtle cutie, you listen to Rachel Goes Rogue for the sneeze edit, and you heard that Achu, say hashtag Achu, and if you for some reason recorded the podcast, please let us know so we can find that original Achu edit. Yeah, That's, I'm, I'm going to go on Reddit and find someone talking about this. That would be great. Um, what were we saying before the Achu? That- um, we were rounding out Sheena and Brock. Right. Um, they talk about Rachel going away um, for, you know, she was originally there for 45 days right. and they said that she was extending for 30 more. Um, also, Rachel talked in her podcast about how, um, remember that whole rumor that she was at Miraval and that yeah. she was actually at a spa, but not a treatment facility or whatever. And she was like, Bravo did nothing to dissuade the public from that rumor. And I'm like, that's not their job. What are you talking about? Uh, right. That's <laughs> yes. I'm glad you brought it up. It's another example of like, like why would they ever, they don't work for you. Why would they ever dispel the narrative of, of you being at Marival at all? Like what? Yeah, you're right. Like it's like, or, you know, or not yeah. being, it's like, yeah, she's it's not been their... Bethany pilled. She was like, Andy Cohen even brought it up on his show. And, you know, because he was basically just feeding off of the news frenzy and was like, people keep saying that uh, Rachel's at a spa or something like whatever. I'm yeah. like, I'm like, you didn't work for like ABC news. Right. Like, it's, no. you know, yeah, I, I think that was a little too much to put on Bravo's shoulders. Yeah. What, what, so the point of this scene was just to check in with Sandoval and, Rachel, basically, right? Yeah, totally. Um, Then we go to Lala, who lives in an apartment building. Her mom has moved in with her, and her brother moved in basically next door. Easton. Yes. Um, And she was saying how um, she's not getting laid because she's essentially with her family 24-7. Rand won't give her full custody because he doesn't want Ocean to be on the show. But he basically gave her every other control which right. is all she cares about. Um, she broke the fourth wall. She goes, I don't give a fuck yeah. <laughs> about Ocean being on Vanderpump Rules. Yeah. Um, why is why does every um, like person that's like been like 
in the Bravo universe that's not on anymore, like <laughs> immediately retract the kids being on the show. Like, I mean, it's one form of control because it's like that's one legal thing that they can easily be like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. But she's like already been on it, right? Right. Well, it's and just he petty. was on it. Yeah, it's petty. I, I but yeah. it's just like I don't. Yeah, it, it just it does suck for the parent who's on a reality show who can't show their child. Right. Although um, I feel like she probably leans towards the direction of actually it being better for her not to be on the show. You know what I mean? Like. I feel like Lala is kind of like, I don't know. I, I can know, see was, her being like, yeah, I don't need my baby on the show. I don't know. Wouldn't she want to show that facet of her, uh, you know, uh, personality? Like we talked about before, she kind of keeps an arm's length. She really does. Um, yeah. So she gets final say on education and health. So we'll see what choices she makes there. Um, but yeah, she really, this is her introduction of saying that uh, she's crying all the time. And I don't even remember her being this upset last season. It feels like she's been like freshly burned post Scandaval being like re-triggered by her experience. I assume you're going to say she's laying it on thick. I only <laughs> because what she did with Rachel was rung so false to me uh, and made me skeptical of everything Lala is doing. And I've been skeptical of Lala in the past yeah. in terms of what she brings to the show and, yeah. and how authentic it is. I really thought when she's in her confessional, she goes, last year I was really focused on custody issues with Ocean, but this year I'm focused on the heartbreak from my relationship with Randall. And it just seemed to me very clearly like last season, season, my arc was about this. Right. This season, my arc is about this. It's like those two things could have gone hand in hand last season. You could have been emotionally distraught and sad about Randall and also been fighting for custody. Also, I don't really remember her custody battle playing out that much in season 10. I don't think it got a lot of... I don't think she was even allowed to talk about it. Right. So I'm just... I, I just felt like this was setting up the audience to know specifically that she's going to be processing her feelings about Randall two years after the fact, which if it legitimately is starting to stir in her and making her emotional and she's really thinking about it, I understand. But because she does a calculated kind of strange thing for the season later in this episode, I have to possibly allow for the fact that she's just letting us know what her arc this season is going to be. That now is the post Now is the Randall reckoning in her life. You know what I mean? Yeah. When she should be a little more removed from that now. Yeah. I did like that she chose that uh, conversation about distrust to question Ariana's new boyfriend, which I'm like, let's keep that on the table. Yeah. I'm glad that she went immediately to that. And then they kind of touch on it again a little later. Like Sheena makes like a little comment, but not really, but like a little bit where I'm like, I mean, we'll get there, but. Ariana reveals in this episode that she met that man 10 days after she found out. Ten, yeah, 10 or 11, she laughs. <laughs> she laughs for, yeah. That's I, like fucking insane. I'm, it's more shocking when you think about it. Because <laughs> uh, time was standing uh, still during Scandaval, and those 11 days before she, when she was just silent, yeah. seemed like forever. Remember? Yeah. And then when she posted, like, that I'm back. Oh, yeah. You know? Or whatever. Yeah, she posted, like, from that wedding in that pink and green dress but yeah i mean 10 days after i mean that's yeah that's a pretty quick turnaround insane um did you see lala's argyle promo i liked it <laughs> i liked it i was shown that and um lala's a great actor i don't think I, it doesn't change my feelings about how she represents herself in vanderpump rules but she's a <laughs> probably the best actor of all the cast if she was in that movie instead of dua lipa i would maybe go see it yeah lala is a great actor like the it was so she was so funny too like in the uber eats commercial when she was doing the yes bitch or whatever oh, yeah. like, she just <laughs> has great comedic timing savings savings she's funny <laughs> as hell she's yeah. great but i i think that that great acting sort of blends into vanderpump rules sometimes yeah but she's a great actor me and my friends were coming up with you know how there was barbenheimer yes we came up with a new one for garfield there's gonna be a new garfield and argyle gargile and the marketing could have the little backpack with the cat in it but garfield's in the backpack um where did the backpack come from argyle it's um uh bryce dallas howard plays like a writer who's like a nerd and like gets swept up into espionage and she's traveling with her cat in one of those like bubble backpacks oh and that's like a big part of their like marketing is the cat garfield in the back- could be in it garfield that's Great. Could it be? Is there any way to call it gargoyle, or it just doesn't make any sense? 
Maybe that could be Gargo- gargoyle. Because gargoyle is sitting right there and I know. so close. I feel like that's part of what makes it that it's work because you're like gargoyle. It, it sounds like gargoyle, but so, it's argyle and Garfield. So in one of the scenes, you <laughs> she goes, "Can I introduce you to my cat?" And then go, and then Garfield says, "Get a look of me. Get a look." <laughs> At me in here, right? I and like. He's like, I'm hungry lasagna. in here. Lasagna. Lasagna. I'm so hungry in here. I can't believe it's Monday. Let me out. I like that a lot. I didn't even know that Garfield had a movie coming out. Who plays his voice? I think it's Chris Pratt. Oh, right. Chris Pratt did a he's lot of voice. He's ruining all the voices. He did a lot of one voice. by one. He did a lot of voice work um, during COVID. Mario? Yeah. Didn't think of that, that what you will, but. Um, <laughs> It, so yeah, well, that's, uh, yeah, I I do like it. Gargoyle and Lala was great in that promo. I think that was so fun. Yes. Okay. I hope she got a good dollar for that. I was just, as you all know, rewatching Roni. I just got to the episode where Dorinda and Sonia, I think, talk about the movie The Hustle for at least five minutes. What is it? It's is baked this, in. It's the scene where they go to the movies and then talk about it afterwards for an entire scene. And that, I'm like, this is like an FCC violation. That was the weirdest thing that Bravo did. <laughs> they started to do actual commercials within Bravo shows. Yeah, I'm like, you can do that like in between, like interstitial, but you can't put it in. No. Were they, ta- they were talking about how good it was and stuff? They were like, Anne Hathaway's character reminded me of my daughter. And you're like, what the hell? I blocked that out completely. <laughs> I can't believe that. Um, I like the ones that are interstitials. I love any Bravo, um, what do they call that, integration? Me too. Like, I think they're oh. really funny oh, me too. and like bizarre yes. and just fun to watch. Yeah, but don't put, don't make a commercial within a show right. and make it part of the plot. Well, also, if you rewatch, there was so much. Remember when they had that Priv era where they would call, it was like a concierge hair and makeup service. Oh, okay. And every time they were going out, like Tinsley would use it, Jules would use it. And they'd be like, my team from Priv is here. The fastest and easiest way to curl my hair and get my makeup done. And you're like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's a little more, <laughs> I'm okay with that a little bit more just because I'm used to so much product placement in it, but you're right. I mean, that's that sounds uh, pretty bad. <laughs> I just saw, have you seen the um, trailer for J-Lo's movie? It's no. It's supposed to be, it, I think she thinks it's going to be her lemonade, but it looks ridiculous. Oh, like about um, her sort of uh, relationship ending? And, it's and- like, yeah, she's like gets married a million times and it looks like it's basically like a million music videos strung together okay but it's going to be on amazon prime but someone pulled out that i don't know if it's in the a music video or from the movie but she, at one point there's people painting like a wall and they're fully geared out in benjamin moore oh wait and what's that <laughs> like paint oh okay oh so it's it. <laughs> it's just like sponsored to the hilt including benjamin moore like it's not like beats by dre or like you know like lipstick it's like Benjamin Moore. That's wild. <laughs> um, yeah, because it's not really a brand that you associate with paint for it's the not most part. Sexy. Yeah. No, was, you do associate. You exactly associate <laughs> it with paint. <laughs> Did, was J Lo in that movie it, on Peacock that came out during COVID called "Will You Marry My Mom" with Owen Wilson? <laughs> Marry me. Marry me. Was I that J Lo? Theaters. You saw it in theaters. <laughs> you know, I see everything. That was a horrendous movie. It was bad. Owen Wilson's the most like mind fuck casting of all time. It made no sense. People thought that was bad casting, right? Yeah. But he's so good in other stuff. Sure. So, oh, you don't think so? No, I do. Oh, oh yeah. But he was just miscast there. <laughs> he's like MIA. I, he's having a rough time. Yeah. He those, needs, those brothers. Wes Anderson needs to reclaim him. And something is going on Does with Does he Luke. still write those movies with him? Or I don't no? think so. I don't. I think Wes Anderson only writes with Roman, Roman Coppola now. Yeah. But I really feel like that's just like Roman says, wouldn't it be funny if there was a, you know, I don't Did know. Did he I, co-write Royal Tenenbaums? I think, I think. Definitely Bottle Rocket. Yeah, Wes, or sorry, Owen was Bottle Rocket for sure. Maybe Royal Tenenbaums. Then he got Noah Baumbach for Life Aquatic. Okay. And then he switched over to being a full Roman Coppola okay. guy. What's who your just, favorite? Life Aquatic. It is? Oh, yeah. And you revisit. Yeah, it's, it, that's my favorite. It's the, the last, well, I, I love, I've, on rewatch, I love Grand Budapest Hotel more Me than too. I, I ever thought. I watched it thought. on a plane, yeah. like, six months ago, and I loved it. I it's really funny. Ray Fiennes, that's how you say his name, right? Yeah. Ray Fiennes, that's one of the best performances I've ever seen, and one of the best characters ever created. I love him in that movie. It's like the, he's the, it, like, a perfect Wes Anderson uh, character yeah. in that movie, and he's so good in it. Yeah. I think I'm like forever Royal Tenenbaums pilled. I love it too. Um, I think my Life Aquatic 
fandom is because it's a little more underrated. Yeah. And I do think it's the level of humor is a little like darker and it's less whimsical. And I love Bill Murray, even though he's a yeah. horrible, horrible person. <laughs> yeah. I love him and Owen Wilson as a son. Like everything about it. I, I love, yeah. but maybe I would No, when I watched grand Budapest, uh, recently, I was like, I had sort of like not revisited it. Cause I thought maybe it was like too much. Cause today in 2023, I'm a little bit oversaturated on the yeah. aesthetic and everything, but revisiting it, I was like, Oh, it's like, it's very funny. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it it's it's <laughs> great. And I also thought it was a lesser work when I watched it because I was so used to, um, you know, yeah, Royal Tenenbaums and Rushmore and stuff. I thought it wasn't as good, but now rewatching, it's like it's. I think it's up a mo- like top five or top three, top four. Yeah. Wes Anderson's. I, I love it, and I think that him and Ray Fiennes have a, a that was like the best find ever to make to cast him as that. Yeah. I forget what his name is, Gustav. Yeah, I hope that he like. I think he needs like a shakeup. I think so too. I think he needs to write with someone else because mm-hmm. I think he is running on fumes. I mean, I saw Asteroid City and I thought that was definitely a minor work mm-hmm. uh, in my opinion. Like it was fine, but it was just, it was like derivative of himself. Yeah. I think okay. So too. All right. So <laughs> they go to, so this scene next is called, it, they go to Wood and Water, um, right? Schwartz and James. Yes. And to me, this is when a little bit of the artificiality of this universe really comes into play for me. Mm-hmm. I just don't think there's any world, and I know it's a show, so it's like I'm just I'm just judging this. I know it's a show, and they're they have playing to, with their pawns. They're playing with their pawns. I know it. I get it. But still, as a viewer who th- thinks a lot of this is real and it's about these real friendships. Schwartz and James having this reunion to me just it, it didn't I, I don't think of James and Schwartz as very close and yeah. never having a, a one-on-one and I felt a little awkwardness with them there like they don't really know each other that well yeah I also think I don't think Schwartz really loves James that much yeah like if Schwartz was choosing his friends James wouldn't be in the top 10 yeah so it just felt very forced and I felt like it, this felt awkward to me in my yeah. opinion I, and I, I'm, I'm judging it harshly yeah um yeah schwartz said he was wearing his schwartz and sandy's hat for the first time since scannable because he's been too scared and i almost wore my schwartz and sandy hat because i had the same exact one in honor of that moment but i was afraid that then when we put these clips on the internet that people would think i was some sort of right-wing troll for sure they would i mean absolutely they <laughs> so would. i wore my sir hat instead that's good. yeah that's fun there's nothing bad about sir um but yeah james is like uh, he reveals that he's sober currently, Cali sober, and he makes it very clear that he smokes weed in excess. So I'm like, okay, so still addictive behavior. Cool. Yeah. Like <laughs> I didn't know. I kind of forgot full blown. Like he's like uh, smoking it up like all day, smoke all, all day. Yeah. I'm I, like, you don't have to keep saying that you smoke weed at all times. Yeah. I also don't think that people sh- need to define anymore. Cali sober. Like if you just say you're sober, I think it doesn't everybody think it means like weed could possibly be included in there i guess yeah i, I said um, that qualification i don't i don't feel like we need it anymore but maybe I'm yeah wrong. it's also funny that weed i mean i guess there are all kinds of weed but weed does not chill him out i think he's smoking the the uppers oh sticky, like icky icky Oh, you're talking about those <laughs> strands that we have where it's like There's one like is crack into like cut. purple. You think he's smoking crank one that makes it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I forgot about his weed usage, but it seemed like, yeah, he likes to get high. Yeah. He, uh, Schwartz gives him a plant and a candle and James said that it smells like, um, citrus pussy. <laughs> yeah. I hate to say. <laughs> I hate to say it too, and I didn't like watching it. And uh, this that that was like uh, it was sort of awkward humor where I was feel like they are like um, reintroducing themselves to each other, and it yeah. just felt a little out of character, both of them. But yeah, yeah, you said it. Uh, he said it smelled like that. Yeah, and then we basically just get a little review where Schwartz says how hard this has been at Schwartz and Sandy's, how um, their reservations are down, staff has quit, that people are coming in and acting crazy. He keeps saying in interviews and stuff, he said multiple times that like the bathroom was vandalized, and I'm pretty sure I know what he's talking about, and it was like someone wrote Team Ariana in the, on the yeah. mirror in lipstick. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, that cannot be considered vandalism. Yeah, I mean... I think we went there when that happened and it's like the one time, but not a big deal. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he was, he was really in the thick of it, you know, and 
Yeah, this is when yeah. he said he says that staff quit and people were harassing the staff, and he, you know, right. he did say that it it became a toxic. I'm sure it was bad for like two weeks. Yeah, like remember their Yelp tanked, and like I mean, whatever. I went not to like call myself out, but I went two or three weeks after, and it was, it was a, your journalistic duty. It was a journalistic duty, but also yeah, it was not bad. People were not being horrible or screaming or no, doing anything. I feel like maybe just... that like first week, but I think I think it was more the stress of overall what was going to happen it would probably made it seem more intense it was just yeah it was just such bad timing that they opened this bar and then immediately one of the co-owners does this <laughs> horrific thing and then you right. have a place where people can excise their rage or, right um exercise yeah. their rage he's saying uh again that uh his last year was horrible like obviously his divorce his brother's health um and that scandal was a radioactive cherry on a shit sunday yeah um he also says that um sandoval like rallied so hard to have the bar called schwartz and sandy's and i feel like schwartz didn't fight that hard against it it was katie that hated it but also he was implying that it shouldn't have had their names at all but i'm trying to remember what the other options were because it wasn't it still name based uh, I forget. I, I forget. Katie had a, a other... Uh, I do think he hated the name. And remember, he was like... He let Katie kind of speak for him. Yeah. And he was like, Schwartz doesn't want to admit to you how much he hates it. And Tom Sandoval was such a... You know, <laughs> was so attached to this name. But yeah, I think Schwartz implied that he would have called it something else. Like, I, oh yeah, I don't know. But... but and then, and then maybe people wouldn't have so associated it with them. Right. Yeah. I guess you are like... If you don't know the context, you say... Who's Schwartz and who's Sandy? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good name. I never thought it was a bad name. Do you think it's a bad name? What was Katie's idea? Bar and Grill. It was like something dumb. I don't... <laughs> to, oh, it was it was to the... Oh, it was like Tom to the... It, it had a play on words with Tom. Um, yeah. We'll remember it sometime. Tom, once upon a Tom. Once upon a Tom. <laughs> yeah. I, I think Schwartz and Sandy's is still better. Yeah. More Did, fun. Did she, did, did she not, did Katie not like it because it says Sandy's? I don't know. She just didn't like any of it. She just wanted to run the show. Um, yeah. Did you like Schwartz's Bill Clinton impression? I loved it. I'm so <laughs> glad you said something about it. He did a nine out of 10, very good Bill Clinton. Um, I forget, it was in regards to kissing Raquel. He was like, yeah. I'm glad me and uh, James can still be friends despite my little indiscretion. Yeah. Uh, I love that Bill. He really fun. had it was great. I was yeah. proud of him. <laughs> um, yeah, and then James reveals, this is an affirmation for us. We have revealed previously that James works out at Equinox, and he confirms that fact here. Now we can absolutely... <laughs> but now we've said it. Now we've said it. We were early to say he did it, and we didn't know how we should feel about saying it, but he officially is an Equinox uh, person. He goes there all the time. So His now we can talk about it all the time. rock hard. He's buff. Um, yep. He looks good. James like needed to age into... He was so scrawny pipsqueak when we we're watching the early seasons, and he looks fantastic. Did you notice his eyes? When every time he wore blue, his eyes looked like insane. Yeah, he looks wonderful now. <laughs> He's buff. His eyes are big and bright. And yeah, I'm proud of him. That Jude Law chin. Yep. Okay. Ariana and Sheena go to a spa in Century City, which I deduced is them meeting in the middle because she lives in Marina Del Rey. Yes. Uh because I recently drove to Century City and it is not close to me. <laughs> how f how long did it take you? Uh, well, we did something else first, but it's far. And I have a doctor's appointment there in a couple weeks. So I have to go again. And I anticipate it's going to take 40 minutes at least. Oh, that is so rough. So yeah, you're right. <laughs> I didn't understand why they were going to Century City, but now it makes perfect sense. It's a meet in the middle type. I think so. And they're going to the, the, a place called the Fairmont Spa. Fairmont hotels are very nice. They are? Yes. Oh, I had no idea. Yes. This this spa looks cool. I liked it. The Langham is a Fairmont, which is near you, so you should go there. Oh, I do. I want to go to the Langham. It's very nice. So what <laughs> what are they So in addition to having spa time and having, you know, talking to each other, what is the heart of this scene? I think we're really just checking back in, getting more from this is where we find out that Ariana where she met Dan. Um, they show the photos of them, like everything they've done so far. She reveals that he's a personal trainer and a bartender, which I didn't know the bartender part. Me neither. Which is interesting. Um, she says that they're doing something 
long distance and that uh, Sheena reveals that him and Brock are workout buddies. And Sheena's like, we finally found good guys, finally. And I'm like, she's known him for like 14 days. Like, how do we know? Right. Like, it took Tom uh, 10 years to fuck her over. Yeah. Also, <laughs> um, Megan said, she said, like, what was wrong with Shay? Like, he wasn't that horrible. You know, <laughs> right. it's like, it's an unnecessary shade <laughs> towards Shay. He wasn't, all he was was like having a, a hard time with- One could argue with... that Brock has a, a more checkered past. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sheena reveals that she's currently not drinking for three weeks because she's on Zoloft because she kind of says it's because of Scandaval that her anxiety, she got diagnosed with OCD. She already had anxiety and it, they kind of coalesced during this super stressful time and she's been struggling and has become very paranoid about Brock and what he's up to and if he would fuck Lala, which is interesting because that was that rumor that was going around. So right. that must have just like driven her insane hearing that all the time. Yeah. And also I think that I think she did. I don't know if she says it here specifically, but um, you know, the, the restraining order and the, sure. and being labeled, uh, you know, whatever that comes with like legally was probably so scary for her. The fact that she could lose, like, I don't know, like what happens to your like, parental um right uh what's that called you're like yeah i think she was really worried about the fact that this could have like really affected her family and i don't think she specifically wants to bring it up anymore there was the restraining order at this point but i think that i mean going to the court and dealing with all that shit must have been pretty like anxiety inducing for sure which on rachel's side on her podcast was saying that sheena was very performative about it because she basically I don't I don't even know what to think between the two of these women because first of all I think that am I allowed to say allegedly maybe Sheena did punch her in the face allegedly I think you get allegedly allegedly, allegedly. and uh, I think that all of the girls on the show are going to take it to the grave that they all know that to be true allegedly 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 I don't I think because it's horrible legally I don't want to <laughs> say that you know, specifically, allegedly, but I think that that is, that is the assumption that everyone is operating (laughs) under. And Rachel has decided that she shouldn't have done that. Ultimately, she did, shouldn't have taken it to that level, but she resents how Sheena used the court system to make it seem like Rachel was using the court system on uh, what's that like fraudulent cases or, or right. like wasting the court's time on frivolous cases right. that had no so it was more like Sheena made it a victory for herself when in right. reality Rachel I think regrets that she even filed the restraining order right it seems like I don't know I, I, I truly don't know who to believe because I'm like I think it's probably somewhere in the middle where Rachel is implying that Sheena should have known that it was basically moot and dropped and that she didn't need to show up to court where we were that day oh yeah and and do this whole grandstanding thing but at the same time i totally understand why if there is any lawsuit you want to do due diligence so that you're protected on your side and can't get hit with some unexpected thing of like well you didn't show up so it's like i'd probably rather show up than not show up i know regardless especially because rachel's communication is very confusing so i understand why Sheena would just take it super seriously. Yeah, and she did waste the court's time and our time when she didn't show up. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I don't... It's weird. Also, Uh, speaking of... I'm just going to say this really quickly. The uh, wasting court's time, I just watched a uh, TikTok of, you know, the tattoo artist Kat Von D. Yeah. She apparently has been getting sued for years because a photographer who took a photo of Miles Davis is suing her for tattooing that image on someone. No way. And it's like this whole like legality of like, if you need to license a tattoo. There... And I'm like, since fucking when? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, I know it's ridiculous. Like you should be able to have Bart Simpson <laughs> and drawn all people over do. You. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, it's horrible. I, I think, <laughs> I, well, you know, and they also have to clear them for production. You can't right. have unlicensed tattoos appearing. You can't have Bart Simpson or or even a tattoo artist like original creation. You have to like license it as that's art. That's so crazy. I know. I think it's, it's. I don't know. Yeah, you're right. I mean. But it, I think that's... she won, but um, it took years. And I'm like, imagine how many cases are just like total BS. Like what percentage do you think? Yeah. And it makes me like worried about my miles davis tattoo i know 
I have one on my entire ass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you brought this up because it really makes me rethink why we both have, you know, our gigantic we Miles got him Davis. At Bravo <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I will say, uh, I, I, well, I don't want to short shrift this conversation because it's one of our best of all time. But I will yeah. say, in the, you know, just to, I don't want to do a peek behind the curtain, but I yeah, do think for the sake of time, just for the sake of time. And I hate to acknowledge that I, you know, that, that I have to speed up. But I think for, for me, you know, getting to the meat of this episode, yeah. I don't know if we're, we're there pretty much. I right? think we at least just the last thing on this is we have to read the text that Ariana sent to Schwartz. <laughs> Yes, let's do it. Okay. Yes, yeah, for sure. It turns out Ariana had shorts blocked, but then she watched him on Watch What Happens Live, and he that's when he said that Sandoval is struggling and people should hug him if they can. Right. Then she unblocked him to text him, and she goes, I don't think what I said was so bad. I don't remember. And then he reads it, and it says, fuck you, blocking your number, go choke on Sandoval's dirty ass dick some more. Right. <laughs> and I'm like... Whoa, we are back in May. <laughs> like we are like yeah. full anger, cheese grater. Yes. That's exactly what I thought. It's like you just yeah, you just channeled the Ariana from the reunion. Which I'm like people are memeing the hell out of it. People are being like, She is so me, like hello. Like I'm like, yeah, it's funny, whatever. But I'm also like, if that were me, I would feel like sad that I was that like hurt and angry that I said something like me, that. Me too. No, yeah. I mean <laughs> Yeah, she's just like us, like what we all say to people all the time, which, you know, no one does. It's just, yeah, it's just like people, yeah, love that uh, she was horrible to Schwartz <laughs> about what he said. Yeah, um, yeah I, I thought I, I thought more Ariana would look back on that and be like, like you said, like, oh man, I like, that's one of those things like maybe I should have slept on it before right. I, you know. That's what Dorinda says, say it, forget it, write it regret it i love that that's a great <laughs> motto to live by um okay so this is the final location tom tom we get basically everybody's there we get a peak of ken lisa comes in um now just so you know uh megan and i and our friends yes were there that night for that event and i had no idea when we went there that that was the first episode i i didn't know how long right. we were into filming the fact that that was the first episode i had no clue at all but when schwartz walks in you can see megan and i i'm hiding behind a bush oh. and you can just see my legs but megan is very prominently seen okay, so i need for, to watch it again yeah i mean it's for one second you know yeah. basically just background for one second but um we were there and it was the most chaotic i mean you can see it like it was the most bustling bustling like Turtle Time Headquarters. Um, yeah, I think I remember I was like, we had gone uh, recently or we had, I, I couldn't go yeah. again. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, it makes sense. It was a, it was when we had been to all of the Vanderpump Row restaurants 50 times. Yeah, so and that was, the Sandoval show, I think, pretty recently. Yeah, but I mean, just them going there to film at this time like I know Lisa wants obviously this to happen at Tom Tom and, and for it to be in the premiere episode. But it is the worst location they could have ever chosen to have an impactful scene. Yeah, it is so hindered by the uproarious nature of everyone filming and screaming that it's the first time I've ever thought um, it, it was a really sloppy, sloppily edited scene. Like you can hear them like cutting out audio because they can't hear each other at all. So you hear like mics drop in and out when they're talking and everything. Yeah. It was just, it was a really bad location to and shoot. And there's just people standing in the background looking at them. Yeah. And like, I already noticed when people are filming all scenes at, at any restaurant in the city, but this was like every single person is fully captivated by what those cast members are doing at this right. location. It was just, I don't know. It was, it was kind of a, I know they have to be there for Lisa, but still it's like, it, this was the worst environment to film. In. yeah um yeah so then they make a big thing out of uh ariana returning to the scene of the crime she's sitting in the same seat that she was that fateful night yes. when we were there um she still she doesn't want to talk to schwartz um did you what did you think about him saying in his confessional he was like I get it. She's reached this exalted status, Queen Ariana, patron patron saint of scorned women. Did you find that condescending or valid? 
Uh, no, I said neither. <laughs> Thank you for asking an either or. I found it to be his way with words, which is sometimes very eloquent when he wants to be. And I think it sounds condescending when you say patron saints of scorned women. But I think that's a literary flourish that he added that mm-hmm. is representative of how he talks sometimes. But it could very much be construed as condescending. And I get why it sounds bad. It, yeah. it, it, re- it really did sound bad, but I don't think that's what Schwartz meant. I yeah. think it was just... For him, it accurately described what's going on with Ariana. Sure. And I think imagining that he filmed that confessional later when she had been exalted even further, yes. like when it was so out of control, yeah. like I think it even makes more sense. Yeah. Um, they do a whole litany of Tom Tom flashbacks slash Tom and Ariana relationship flashbacks, which this was sad. Yeah, this was sad. And this was probably one of the highlights for the episode because I didn't, you know, I didn't really, none of those scenes that we've already talked about really popped for me except as table setting, but it was good to provide the context of what it means to Ariana to be at Tom Tom, in addition to it just being a filming location that they all have to go meet at. I did love seeing the context of their beautiful moments at the opening of Tom Tom, the, the scene where Ariana talks about her depression with Tom mm-hmm. and she goes, can we go home? <laughs> like when you see their highlight reel, yeah, it's, it, it, puts it into context again and when, how yeah. hurt Ariana is over this whole thing. And I, and I liked that because without it, I wouldn't have thought it was that big of a deal for Ariana to be back. That yeah. was like the kind of editing flourish that I appreciated. Yeah. Like he says, um, they show the clip when Tom Tom opened that he was like, this has been the two happiest years of my life. Like uh, when we started dating yeah. and then now with the bar opening or whatever. And I'm like, I don't think he's full of shit. Like he really loved her for sure. Like a lot. Um, but they just, and also like when they showed, they mirrored uh, Katie and Ariana walking up together the first yeah. time. And then this time, and you really like watching it. I know that Katie supported Schwartz, but Ariana, like, to use her words, was like so ride or die for Tom, yes. which I understand the rage when I think of it that way, where it's like, you piece of shit. Like I, I did everything you said. Like even though she was probably like eye rolly to him or whatever, or thought she was smarter than him or whatever, she still like went along with everything for him for yeah. so long. Yeah. So I get it. Yeah. It, it, yeah. That was, that was very sad. Um, and Ariana gets upset you know, there and they all comfort her, which I thought was I sweet. Lisa, like it was like they were telepathically like starting to cry together. Yeah. Like Lisa like started to get like welling up and then Ariana started to well up and they like grabbed hands and they were both like about to cry. And yeah. I was like, oh my God. That was sweet. And then uh Lala says, Lisa, I have something I'd like to talk to you about. So can we please go over here? And then that's where I I was in that room where okay. that conversation happened. Just looking at that conversation, I had no idea what the hell they were talking about. Okay. And Lala says, "Is this for the is this the first time she says that she's made this decision, or did she say it earlier in the episode, or is this a complete surprise?" Uh, I think that she's brought up. I think. I, I think she's start has she brought it up before. Laid the breadcrumbs for this decision. Yeah, that she's starting to relate to Rachel. She basically brings up the last five minutes of the reunion, which I forgot how shocking and fun oh. that was when she goes, Fine, I'll tell you everything. Yeah. No, like the, the producer asks one last time and she caves. Oh yeah. No, and no, it no. like changed the course of history. <laughs> that was great. And Lala says that specifically when Rachel said, If I lose Tom, if I if I tell the truth and I lose Tom, I will have no one because mm-hmm. he is my, my the last uh, person I have as support. And Lala says that that statement is what uh, made her have an emotional reckoning with how she behaved and want to reach out to Rachel mm-hmm. um, to uh, talk to her and, and if, she want, if she's open to talking to her. Now, yeah. first, I was like, why that statement? Mm-hmm. Uh, like there's a lot of things Rachel said mm-hmm. a lot of things that were emotional at that the last final five minutes where she's unburdening her soul or whatever specifically I didn't really understand why Lala that isolated part made her reminded her of Randall she wasn't isolated with Randall right I mean like she had her family she had friends I I, I don't I didn't know that if that was the right rationale mm-hmm. to point to as, as what really struck a chord with you out of everything. I right. thought that, that was a little bit reaching, but if it's not, yeah. you let me know. Yeah. I mean, I guess kind of just like, um, like protecting him at all costs because of, you know, 
I feel like the relationship that you've uh, built together is built on lies. Yeah. And so you kind of just have to ke- turn a blind eye to keep it up, keep up appearances. Yeah, um, I, I, I guess so. I was a little like, okay, that's what, you know, that's what got you like after like everything that you've been through with, with they, Rachel. They showed a montage of every time they fought, which I forgot how many times. Yeah. <laughs> there's like Bambi eyed bitch and then like the Rottweiler. I was and, not your friend. Yeah. Like there's like 10 examples. And yeah. uh, Lisa's like, I'm surprised Lala of all people. And she's like, well, maybe there's hope for the others then, which Lisa, this whole, since day one has wanted this shit to be over. <laughs> she's like, can you guys just forgive them? I'm over it. Yeah, exactly. And I think that Lisa saying, I'm very surprised <laughs> of all people that Lala is the one to forgive her is sort of code for you're the cast member doing this. Right. Like you, you're the one who wanted to reach out to Rachel first for, right. of everyone. I just, I, I just think that Lala making this about her when it's, she was already tangential to this original, uh, Scandival anyway, right. very tenuous connection to it. Why she felt so aggrieved. She really had to justify why she felt aggrieved. And in this instance, she's saying why she feels like she should be the one to reach out. And I just think everyone on the cast wanted to have a, the first scene with Rachel where they bring her back to the fold. And Lala just thought, this is a great excuse for me to, to get right. some spotlight on a thing. Do you think she like anticipated that Rachel was going to return to the show and Absolutely. that this was going to be her launching off point and then she had to like create it manually? Absolutely. That um, is exactly what I think. I think that she expected Rachel to um, commit to filming and she knew that Lala could Lala would be the one to be the bridge between them and have a lot of powerful scenes if Rachel actually returned. And now we know that she didn't. <laughs> yeah. Lala just has no storyline with Rachel. So she kind of just made this like... Um, I mean, it's not a betrayal, but she sort of like went out on a limb to be sympathetic to someone who is ultimately not going to film at all. And so there's no resolution. There's no storyline. It's kind of just a full flop. Right. Yeah. So she goes out to the back patio or whatever. And uh, at first it seems like she's calling her, but it's revealed it's an Instagram voice memo message. Yes. um, Where she's just basically like, I would love to have a conversation with you. I hope you're doing well, whatever. Um, On Watch What Happens, she reveals that she never responded. Um, and she also, Lala also said that if she would have known that she was going to go do Bethany's podcast and do all of this, like Rachel going rogue, that she never would have done this is what she said. Right. And, and to me, um, that is Lala backpedaling mm-hmm. from this, uh, this inauthentic decision she made to um, pretend like she wanted to be the sympathetic ear to right. Rachel. Yeah. And now I even in the after show, which I'm sorry to keep bringing up. <laughs> no, please. Cause but I didn't watch it. Lala says um, she gets uh, indignant and mad and goes, and I also wanted to confront Rachel about how the fuck she could call me a mistress when she had, oh. was harboring that knowledge. And I'm like, Oh, that was not your intention at all. You were like, crying and upset and wanted to be there for Rachel if she needed you. She's trying to retroactively or what's that that yeah. what's that called? She's trying to retroactively add nuance to this very calculated decision because it flopped and she has to justify her behavior. And she's she, she just, even said in this episode, like all the things that people called me a mistress of yeah. home wreck or whatever, she said it's true. She was ready to give Rachel a sympathetic edit and be there for her because she thought it would be a good storyline. And then when Rachel did all this Bethany <laughs> shit, she's like, God damn, I, <laughs> I reach out to the one that like is not going to be on the show. Like what a flop. And then she has to now justify and pretend like she was doing it because she also had other stuff to say to Rachel like you know like to get to the bottom of so yeah no it's definitely like very producer hat yes Um, but I do uh understand why someone that was leading the front of that reunion series uh would perhaps feel remorse but it seems like she doesn't really but I think I would feel very dirty if I watched back how gnarly the reunion was yeah no i yeah i I agree and also like sheena couldn't do this ariana couldn't do this katie would never do this yeah so it is it does make sense that lala was the only one but it's just so out of character and i don't trust her motivation and i think she's already tried to nullify why she did this to i so i know it's inauthentic yeah and um yeah so that you know that's my thoughts on it it's only because i just i do think lala kind of um really needs a storyline 
Yeah, like, for sure. More than any other cast member. She really needs to justify her presence on the show. Yeah. Did you see Ariana's Olympics commercial? Yeah. Get that she cash. goes, I, I'm I'm too busy to be on a Royals reality show because I'm going to be at the Olympics. Yeah. She's like, I have plans, which um, I'm curious. A lot of people think the Olympics are canceled. Why? Ethically. Oh, OK. I don't want to get into it. <laughs> um, yeah. She's going to carry the torch. <laughs> she should. That would be so cool. She should run from Greece to Paris. That would be so fun. OK. And then I just want to shout out how cute Gordo and Butters are. I screamed. So cute. So fucking cute. Um, yeah, they have, I feel like Tom and Katie, they just, they talk about uh, Ariana, how he's blocked and um, Sandoval. Well, yeah. And, and Schwartz wants to, um, his storyline, but I'm not calling it a storyline because I think it's legitimate. This is a real thing. He wants to talk to Ariana again and try to have a conversation with her because she very much still associates him with Sandoval, which she should at this point. Yeah. But he wants to. So he said, Katie, if you could ever put in a good word for me, I'd love to talk to Ariana again. Yeah. So they're sort of, he's creating a strategy so that maybe him and Ariana could sit down together, which yeah. I'm sure will happen because I don't think Ariana can carry the rage that she has towards Sandoval and put that on Schwartz as well. Forever. I imagine scenes with Schwartz. I'm sure, yeah, later. Yeah, um, but I, I, I'm. I have to keep reminding myself how early this is. Also, when you saw that tank on the ground, where you're like, "Oh no, did he get another lizard?" Yeah, but and then it, it turned out it was bugs. It's bugs. Who gets bugs? It. They're bugs. <laughs> Can I, can I talk about the after show again? Yes. He released those bugs into the wild. Why? Because he didn't want to take care of them. Oh, or, or, or he. What made he, him get bugs? I have no clue. But he's. I swear, he said that he released those bugs into the wild of va <laughs> of Valley Village, or where does he live? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> But I'm, it's just, why does he do this with animals? Oh, my God. All right. Whatever. All right. Well, so then he gets... I feel like no better uh, to like sign that you should have left your ex than you come into their house and instead of a coffee table, there's just a tank on the floor with bugs in it. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. Where he's I mean, like, I'm raising bugs. And you're like, okay, bye. <laughs> I got to go. Where are Butters and Gordo? Um, okay. So okay, the then final the last scene. final final dinner, right? And I liked this for them, right? We're, yep. we're with uh, Ariana, Sheena, Lala, and Katie. Powerful uh, yes. four people. I, I like, coven. I love it. Coven. Powerful coven. Is that what you said? Yep. Um, this is a great, they are friends. And this is a, a like like how I said Schwartz and James are sort of bending the reality to like go to dinner. This is a real dinner with friends. And yep. I believe that they all love each other. This is a fun dinner. And then Lala says to Ariana, in the spirit of being open and honest, she says to Ariana, just so you know, um, I reach out to Rachel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if she needs someone to talk to, right? Mm -hmm. And then she tells everyone, uh, everyone is shocked, Katie especially, yeah. is so shocked that Lala is making this revelation, and Ariana takes it better than you would ever imagine. Yeah. Like, almost like now, like, I think she has I the I was future. relieved. Me too. Yeah. She could have, speaking of inauthentic fake shit, she could, Ariana, if she wanted to, could have done, gone scorched earth on Lala, made that the wildest scene we've ever seen. Yeah. But she kept her true feelings true and does not care. Like, because she understands Lala's uh, rationale, I guess, for doing this or thinks Lala did this for the show and I'm not going to get so <laughs> mad at her because she wants a storyline. Right. Yeah, and nothing had really come out of it yet, so it didn't really matter. Um, this is also where Katie does send Schwartz's message to Ariana and quickly says, like, he was just saying he's sad that, like, you won't talk to him. And she's like, too bad. Um, and Lala is also in his defense saying, we need to, like, unravel the years of, to quote her, uh, emotional or, like, mental abuse that Sandoval has uh, yes. put upon uh, Schwartz. And Ariana says, similarly, she's doing a lot of unlearning, with it, which I think is true in, like, a lot of relationships, especially with, like, loyalty and, like, especially their Vanderpump Rules dynamic of having to, like, hold lies and, like, yes. have alliances. Right. And that's where um, she... Uh, Ariana reveals that she's wanted to be closer with Katie for a long yes. time, but Schwartz or Sandoval was always like, be careful. And I thought that was interesting because I always thought that she agreed that Katie was annoying. <laughs> no, you're right. No, no, no. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Like that was to me very interesting and real that like Sandoval had such a hatred towards Katie <laughs> hatred. I mean, the hatred totally. throughout the entire series that he kept Ariana at arm's length from Katie and they never got to have a, a true friendship, even though she might've 
liked Katie and yeah. wanted to be closer to her. Yeah. They had so many fights. Ariana had fights with Katie because of Sandoval's position on a lot of things. Yeah. So that was great to know. I really like that. And then Lala, I thought this was touching and sweet and actually real of Lala. She goes, is that how you felt about me? Because I always felt like there was a distance between us and that you didn't really like me. You only tolerated me. Yeah. It's like Stassi back in the day who was like, Ariana, why don't you like me? Yes. And Lala. And and I, I like, I felt the same way as Lala where I don't know how Ariana feels about Lala and I didn't know how close she is with Lala. I mean, she said specifically that she's, that Lala is like not in her inner circle or whatever. So I felt like that was kind of sweet. Lala being like acknowledging that they're not really that close and maybe that's something they need to work on. Right. I like the, the, that real analyzation of these friendships Right. that, that I really love. And so this dinner had a lot of that. Yeah. That was interesting. Um, but yeah, it seems like Ariana's a tough nut to crack across the board. Um, and then, yeah, uh, Lala's just going into, you know, how, I feel like I need to say that I understand parts of what Rachel went through. Yeah. Um, and then Sheena's like, they're, Katie and Sheena are kind of like, it's not the same. Like, don't even go there. It's not the same. Um, like, the situation is the, like similar, but the players are different. And then Sheena's like, and by the way, she put a temporary yeah. restraining order on me and I'll never forget it. And it's like, okay, back on it being about Sheena. Sheena has to remind why this is affecting her. Yes. Right. Uh, which I'm sure will be a through line. Um, and then it, they're all like, what a great night, great girls night. And then it cuts to Ariana and Tom's house. And you're like, oh, is she coming home from dinner? No. No. A man's sneaker steps down from the yes. Escalade or whatever. Yep. And it's Tom fresh off of World's Toughest Test. Yep. He walks in. You see him go up the stairs and you just hear, hello. Hello. <laughs> um, first of all, two things. Uh, he uses keys to get in his house. So we were debating whether he had keyless entry and why he couldn't get into his house right. when him and Rachel hooked up in the car. Yes. Yes, keys. Yes. So he didn't have his keys on him. And then who is he saying hello to? No, is, is he just p- making sure nobody's home? Hello? They also show that they have like a, um, what was that, like a light bright um, couple's portrait? Um, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. They, they showed it multiple that. times. And then when they went to Sheena and Brock's house, they showed that they have a portrait of themselves in their house wow. too. Um, it, it was a good way to end the episode with Sandoval because you kind of forget that he's absent as the, it goes on. And then when you re, you realize they have that going for them in their back pocket, that Sandoval is now going to be a part of the series, you're like, oh, it's enticing. It's a cliffhanger. I know. It's like, oh, man, Sandoval's back. Do you think world. he was sort of like itching or like what the dynamic was when they were like, well, we're actually picking up like right before you get back like do you think he's like do you think he was fine with that or i think think he was like pissed i think it worked well that he was absent for the first week of filming do you think that's like what they wanted i think so because i mean i was gonna film with him anyways right i think it it was good that they had a little bit of breathing room without him in it so and it gives us yeah like you said cliffhanger something to look forward to like he the episode was fine without him but now we have something to be like ooh how is this like, going to pan out we, you realize we were missing a huge element the entire time and that's going to really shake things up which is great for a se- like a teaser for the season so. do you think that episode 2 will have the toilet flush oh of course i think he's going <laughs> to yeah i think he's going to walk down the next morning and go into the bathroom and then flush the toilet while ariana's giving a house tour or whatever she's yeah. doing so All right. well good well you know, I feel sorry to to rush, but it, this was a two hour and thirty six minute episode, so I feel like we just <laughs> for passed one the... show. That's pretty good. We usually do like four shows, so we can't stop talking. Yeah, and we passed the Nick Vial threshold. That's two true. hours and thirty five minutes. That's all we wanted to do. And yeah, so I'm sorry that we're not going to do you know the ending wrap up, but just know that Amy and I love you so much. <laughs> we hope this was good. This is going to come out a day before, so you're listening to this on Thursday. Yep. If you want additional Vanderpump rules, we are covering from the beginning on Patreon. We're um we're just wrapping up season three right now. Yeah. Um. Should I should I end? Okay, so sorry, and our YouTube just completely <laughs> shut off. I don't know why. I think it's a sign that Amy and I have to leave. But please, uh, you know, if you want to hear us more, go on Patreon. And then also, please leave us a review if you liked us. But don't base us off this episode alone. <laughs> think about the entire arc of the Turtle Time. Just, yeah, not just this one. Okay, we love you so much. Go to sleep now. We love you more than life itself. Bye. This one's for you.